separately, the sanctions were expanded. Uh, the transactions are forbidden with Russian Central Bank. There are also uh, limitations for Russian um, airlines. So it, there, it's not allowed uh, for the planes uh, to fly in the EU airspace and uh, to 26 uh, legal and natural persons. There are uh, limitations for traveling and restrictions. On the 2nd of March, um, several banks were disconnected from, disconnected from SWIFT and also it's not allowed uh, to cooperate with Russian direct investment fund. Uh, so delivery of uh, euro uh, currency notes to any person in Russia. Also, the EU is not allowing to broadcast RT and Sputnik, considering the informative space they have created. And in addition to that, Persona. Uh, there are financial limitations and restrictions for 22 uh, officials in Belarus. On the 9th of March, the EU imposed sanctions against uh, the sea navigation, the goods and technologies, and also cryptocurrencies um, are included uh, in the securities concept. So it's not allowed to deliver cryptocurrencies to Russia. And this is considered a very essential and important step how uh, the EU has re reacted towards circumvention of sanctions, uh, showing that also modern technologies and modern financial market uh, means uh, cannot be used uh, to circumvent sanctions. And also additionally, the it's, sanctions uh, were imposed against uh, 160 natural persons. On the 15th of March 2022, the sanctions were imposed against the natural and legal persons. Also, it's not allowed uh, for the technologies of extraction of oil and natural gas. Uh, the um, metal and uh, imports of the metal and also the luxury goods. The export of a wide uh, circle of uh, luxury goods. And this is very, very important. And um, it is um, starting from 300 euros, uh, uh, very low monetary units. And so there will be a wide range of goods uh, which cannot be delivered uh, to Russia. Also, there is um, a ban to have any transactions with uh, the companies uh, owned by state and also the credit uh, rating services. So this is just a short uh, outlook uh, into the new sanctions against Russia. I just wanted to show that they are comprehensive and very, very essential and it's important uh, to impose them for security of our country and unity of the whole European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabine, for this explanation. We also have uh, several questions uh, from our listeners, and I would like uh, to remind that it is possible to ask questions in uh, the Slido uh, with hashtag uh, sanctions, sanctions, and the question to Sabine. So, do we need to consider the sanctions of other countries, for example, from Canada, Australia, New Zealand? So is there any site where it is uh, able to have access to the list of sanctions and what are recommendations how to search? The whole democratic world has imposed very wide sanctions against Russia. This is a very unique case that the whole world is imposing sanctions, not only the EU, but also other countries, um, Japan, South Korea. And 
in the UK and other countries. And so those sanctions have to be assessed in a specific relationship with a partner in those cooperation countries. Our invitation is uh, to check the uh, web pages of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of those countries. And what is clear for us that those countries are also uh, explaining a lot and they are also publishing lists of sanctions. In addition to that, the US also have imposed uh, very wide sanctions against Russia. And I would like to emphasize that the EU was uh, their allies uh, are trying to uh, set and impose uh, uh, the unified sanctions so that there is an equal procedure how to impose them. Of course, in reality, it's impossible to impose identical sanctions. Uh, they, of course, are uh, uh, submitted to the compromise and united approach and the sanctions set by the US. You can uh, a look them at the US uh, the foreign assets control web page so you can search for them and also in their web page it is just possible to see press releases the uh, uh, most updated the newest sanctions uh, this office has approved i uh, thank you very much sabine uh, one additional question if there is a case of uh, sanctioned person, is there any arbitrating or uh, which uh, uh, institution uh, takes care of this? And we, sp we speak about the EU and the US. Okay, I will try to interpret this question. So most possibly it means uh, um, if you have a contract which is not uh, possible to uh, implement, uh, to execute due to sanctions, uh, I would like to draw your attention that sanctions stand over any contractual relationship. So the contract cannot be executed due to sanctions because sanctions are always over those contractual uh, relationships. If you are in a situation with your foreign partner partner uh, that there is a civil dispute, then most possibly this uh, dispute is solved in the civil rights way and in in order to acknowledge and recognize that this decision made in the third country, uh, our country will assess whether it's in line with our legislation, also imposing sanctions. And if it's about appealing sanctions, it is possible to do in two ways. So uh, the appealing of the EU sanctions. So the first step is possible to write to the council and uh, ask uh, to review this decision, including, including uh, cancelling sanctions. And the second is also you can turn to the EU court and request uh, to cancel uh, specific uh, limitations or restrictions for a specific person and uh, uh, say that uh, th those are unjustified. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sabine. And one more additional question from listeners. So I would like to draw attention to all of you who are listening that we will summarize your questions and afterwards we'll provide written answers because uh, considering your great interest, uh, it will not be possible to answer all all the questions right now, but don't worry. We have noted the questions and we'll find the ways how to answer them. And one more question to you, Sabine, and I hope uh, you will be able to answer this question. And if not, uh, this question will be answered afterwards. So are there any indications and also conditions how to cooperate with uh, the company Latvia's Gas and uh, Latvia's Gas? Unfortunately, uh, you cannot ask about specific cases and specific situations and uh, 
any specific issue and the specific case uh, has to be analyzed and reviewed. So unfortunately, I am unable to answer this question. If you have a cooperation with uh, Latvia's Gaza or you have questions uh, how it is possible to organize and have this cooperation with Latvia's Gaza, then uh, we would invite you to write to our email address, uh, sanctiusmfa.gov.lv, uh, and we will try to answer to your question as uh, soon as possible. Thank you, Sabine. Very good answer. So if we talk about specific cases, let us try to gather information by ourselves. And in case if you need uh, some kind of specific consultation still, then let us use the support of institutions. Thank you, Sabine, for your presentation and also providing answers to questions. And thank you to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the work you've been doing in order to impose sanctions. And uh, uh, from topicalities in sanctions, uh, from this general explanation and conditions that has to be taken into account imposing them. As you saw, the amount and the scope of sanctions is huge and also the sectors. And, and one of the most critical um, are the sanctions in the financial sector and as representatives of um, the finance Latvia Association and representing representing this association, I can say that there is a lot of work and we have imposed uh, already a lot of sanctions uh, and as uh, they are added every day and changed, we have to uh, to review this list and also thank you very much to the Financial and Capital Market Commission that is providing support for the financial sector and uh, in cooperation with the state institutions they are looking for the best solutions for specific cases. So therefore as a next speaker I would like to introduce uh, Kristaps Markovskis uh, who is a uh, representative of Financial and Capital Market Commission and he is Money Laundering and Sanction Department Director, and he will speak about uh, the imposing of international sanctions in financial sector. Thank you, Lima. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can see me and hear me. As the colleagues said several times, this is a these are very broad sanctions, and this is a challenge for us as the supervisors of the market. And we are working in order to answer the un, and clarify some questions you might have. And we are concentrating on the questions we have received from you in order to provide support in implementation of the sanctions. Very briefly, I would like to begin with a slide in order to show the Finance Capital Market Commission role uh, and also introduce you to the world of the sanctions in finance sector. And uh, there are three stages in sanction implementation. Uh, first of all, it is imposition of sanctions and there the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and the Finance Capital Market Commission also has a role, then they evaluate the sanctions, then the next stage comes, which is um, uh, implementation of the sanctions, where we are all responsible for compliance with the regulation. And then there is a supervision block, which is a responsibility also of Finance Capital Market Commission, which is provision of support for these sanctions to be also efficiently and correspondingly uh, implemented in practice. We're talking about some uh, exclusions from those rules and maybe some permissions and uh, permissions also given by Finance Capital Market Commission, but and, and what are the requirements for receiving such um, as Sabine also told about the sanctions which we all need to implement, I would like to divide them into two larger blocks. 
One is uh, restrictions directed towards particular companies and people. And then there is the next block. It is the restrictions on the products, services. And um, each day we see that the amount of sanctions increase. Thus, it is important for us to follow regularly the um, the developments and the, the how the sanctions are added and if we're talking about the sectoral sanctions it is imports as an example um, just a couple of days ago we saw that we were it was prohibited to import metal from russia and here i want to address the uh, businessmen uh entrepreneurs uh, you not only have to look at the direct um, supplier but also with whom they work indirectly because what is the origin of the uh, of the raw material itself because we saw it during times of belarusian sanctions when they had restrictions on um, oil supply there were attempts to import them using other jurisdictions in order to uh, conceal the origin of the product so i would like to say to those entrepreneurs working with such products is that they need to pay attention to the origin of the raw material the next part is export restrictions it is those are very broad restrictions on various products and services as an example i can mention the um, oil industry aviation industry also uh, luxury goods and products and the third part is access to capital and assets where we are not allowed to um, credit to uh, Russian companies and in any way um, provide them access to, uh, to capital. The second block we were talking about uh, regarding the sanctions imposed on particular persons, we're talking about a property and control through property right. Then also indirectly we are monitoring the chains of legal entities in the next slide i will show you how this supervision can be ensured indirectly um, and what to pay attention to uh, i will also give um, total numbers in finance sector banks as at end of the day 11th of march they have already frozen 11.5 million euros and uh, i will I, I can confirm this amount is going to be higher we have received new information from banks and we see that the banks are working very actively they are uh, also monitoring the situation and in total we have uh, two physical uh, two natural persons and 26 legal entities whose assets are uh, frozen we're talking about i want to pay attention to legal entities they are not directly in the sanction list but they are being supervised through the sanctioned uh, persons showing how important it is for us to pay attention to concentrate on not only screening but also um in depth uh, see this situation in the legal structure in the management uh, structure of the company if we're talking about asset freezing and um, cooperation uh, it is not important for us to prove uh, the uh, that that the assets are illegal and that money laundering is ongoing it is not that important in this case it 
is enough if we only show that this is a sanctioned person or how the sanctioned person is um, well is uh, controlling the chain for example indirectly also i would like to talk about the steps which the companies which businesses need to do in order to ensure that their uh, business partners are not sanctioned but um, before i go into some legal um, details i would like to quote mr Karinch. yesterday he said that economic cooperation with russia is not possible and the company is preparing support measures and also he said that we should be looking further uh, beyond the sanctions from the news we receive and what we see as the situation develops in the long term because currently uh, as the russia is uh, realizing their management we have to be thinking about how we get out of this cooperation with russian companies not by finding some legal constructions legal structures how we can make um, how we can still uh, continue cooperation this is important to take into consideration not make exceptions and try to find them but how we work in long term with sanctions and going through this structure how the company how the entrepreneur can make sure that they are not working with a sanctioned person the first is sanction lists where you find where you search for the company or uh, the structure of uh, managers and owners of this uh, company we check whether they are not in sanction list and then we get to one of the five conclusions possible which gives us an opportunity uh, a possibility to make further decisions the first two frames to the left there we see that for example it is straightforward for example the owner or in this case is sanctioned and or is controlled by the sanctioned person then it is uh, straightforward uh, so uh, clear that we are um, that we are seizing the cooperation but uh, if there uh, currently there is no restrictions to cooperation with russia as such but again stressing this further into the future vision that uh, we can have even more sanctions and restrictions imposed and we have to be thinking not only from the sanction uh, list uh, view but also we have to look uh, beyond that the next two uh, squares are showing us an example a situation that for example you see the structure of owners but you cannot conclude who is controlling the particular company and you do indeed also need to make a decision to uh, suspend cooperation with them because it is not clear who is the manager or owner of the company very often we see such difficult structures when they are concealing the beneficiaries or shareholders and um, then there will be situations when there is a possibility that the partners indirectly are controlled by a sanctioned person and then you have to make this risk decision in today's circumstances if there is a possibility if there is a slightest possibility then i think that it is uh, better to seize uh, the cooperation uh, for example but we also can uh, in short term continue cooperation but impose our own restrictions regarding the risks we cannot actively manage 
I will go through some of the examples how the control, direct control or indirect control can be implemented. In this case, we see that the control is realized through another legal entity. So if your uh, cooperation partner is the company Teltnis, then you have to understand who are the owners of that company, are those legal entities, and then you get to natural persons. If we're talking about company Rublis, then company Ruble is uh, sanctioned and you don't have to go to the structure of the owners. But in this case, if you have only the legal entity, uh, you need to know uh, who controls this company if it is not directly included in the sanction list. Another example, which is more sophisticated, is when the control is being um, realized through a person who is uh, in the position, a particular position in a particular company, whereby they can implement control uh, or realize the control over the company. The example shows why we need to uh, review the company structure and legal model, how they work. Another example is the cover-up companies. It is um, from practice and is more difficult example is when also what banks have been able to identify in their measures here we see that the control is being realized not through ownership rights or structures but with an agreement whereby there is a, an agreement between eee and ruble that whether eee is a uh, as an agent or a particular representative representing sanctioned persons uh, or sanctioned legal entities ru uh, ruble interests. With these examples, I wanted to show how the ownership rights structures are used and what are the control elements in order to conceal, in order to hide the sanctioned persons because of course all those people know they are sanctions and they are thinking about the ways uh, how to go around sanctions and uh, circumvent them we're also going to be talking about typologies what we see what finance sector sees what are being used in order for, in order to circumvent the sanctions I want to draw your attention that if it is your responsibility to know and uh, monitor the sanctions and also monitor uh, or make sure that there is no circumvention of the sanctions, then uh, yes, you are also liable according to the law. Now we're going to the next block. It is the permit uh, issue. There are uh, various um, rules uh, when you can relieve the assets and uh, to the left we see for example some of the examples it is for example way uh, salary taxes sanctioned persons and their family family members uh, uh, basic needs in order to ensure the successful processing of payments as i said we have 26 companies behind that there are employees and the taxpayers and in order to ensure the uh, processing of these payments uh, we have also in the commission decided on the general permit which allows the banks after application of the client when it is justified that these are basic needs to provide these payments, processing of these payments. 
so that we do not have to spend time on individual permits, for example, for each salary transaction, for example. And here are both natural persons and legal entities and the information is available uh, on the web page of the commission where you can um, familiarize yourself with the uh, with the terms and uh, to the right we see how these permits are being issued and this is a standard situation when there's no general permit and um, and, and thereby it does not fall into the category of the general permit, then they have to submit an application to the bank where they justify that this is a uh, basic needs which is being asked to be insured. And um, the bank then from its part again performs the initial review, the due diligence, and then they go to FCMC and ask for permission. And then again, we are assessing this permit. We make sure that we see that these indeed are the basic needs and we have no doubt that this is not being done in order to circumvent the sanctions and we can then um, we can then allow such measures to be taken and also on the level of eu through mfa we um, inform uh, other states and uh, eu organizations that we have had such permits so that they do not ask the same uh, the same exemptions in other countries too We're going to the next uh, ne ne next uh, unit is regarding the regarding the liabilities previously uh, already concluded upon, and how to still realize the previously uh, agreed upon contracts, and 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 uh, how far they should be realized before i go to some practical examples some real world examples i want to talk about the principles how we interpret these uh, liabilities we are talking about uh, previously concluded uh, agreements that this is before the sanctions were imposed and here i want to again draw your attention to the terms when exactly were the agreements concluded uh, be, uh, because we have to uh, make sure that they are not actually um, they are not trying to conclude some agreements retrospectively in order to circumvent the sanctions against a person and the second condition it also comes from the explanations of the european commission is that we need to interpret it as narrow as possible because we need to ensure uh, as quickly as possible any agreement uh, termination with sanctioned persons. I want to stress once again that each case has to be evaluated individually by evaluating individual uh, um, terms and conditions and we need to uh, look at when it was concluded the agreement and uh, these <clears throat> and we need to make sure that indeed these liabilities uh, were existing before sanction imposition in this case latvian company a client and the company needs to pay for the product supplied it is a rather simple example. The company needs to show uh, show the documents that the product is supplied, received prior to uh, sanction imposition. And the next condition is that the payment for this product is also made to the Latvian bank. To the bank operating in Latvia. So we need to be able to make sure that 
this uh, money, these assets are going to be frozen immediately so that they are not available to the entity cooperating, uh, which is sanctioned. And uh, as I said also in the previous slide, then we need to um, submit an application to the bank and FCMC to receive a permit. If there is a long-term agreement with a sanctioned person, whereby uh, individual uh, uh, individual orders are being realized, well, can we continue? Of course not. Such agreements uh, cannot continue operating because again as is the previous example uh, and with this master agreement example you simply terminate it uh, we have to take note that this does not only uh, it's not only like that regarding the products but also the services let us go to the third example which is the most difficult but in our practice we have seen such two and i want to individually stress this disclaimer about individual evaluation of circumstances if the product is ordered but not yet delivered what is uh, what are the actions to be taken we have to th think through uh, the view of how we terminate the liability and not how we continue it as long as possible. We see here that there are three conditions uh, on, which we need to take into consideration. And this is first that cancellation of the agreement is not possible. Uh, second one, freezing of the uh, assets is possible or sanctioned person's uh, circumstances are not being improved by this uh, uh, deal. And so these are the three points also which can show that um, commitment uh, compliance is not possible, that the product is produced to the client individually and it cannot be substituted that uh, the product uh, is believed to be already uh, the under the ownership of the client for example when you have to yet cut something or produce something uh, and it has to be returned to the client and also we have to evaluate that situation with losses. So by assessing the legal person, we can see that the uh, losses has to be uh, uh, undertaken by the, by the client and thus the sanctioned person actually remains with more because they are left with the product they do not deliver. And uh, then they are also, th their losses are covered then also similarly to as in the first um, situation we need an application in the bank with justification with explanation whereby the fcmc uh, permission follows and uh, this is my last slide as a summary regarding the liability responsibility from the finance sector uh, we see administrative liability, criminal liability, reputational risk, and um, correspondent relationship risk. Because we have administrative liability, uh, it is possible as a penalty or a restriction of the uh, rights, and also criminal liability is um, provided for by article 84 of criminal law for involvement in circumvention of um, sanctions and also of course uh, risks on reputation in any way if we do get involved in not complying with the sanctions or circumventing them uh, 
Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope that I uh, was able to answer at least part of your questions because uh, I understand there are many questions and in the FCMC homepage we have uh, questions and answers section and also to help you. Thank you, Christops, for uh, the presentation. Uh, I want to say that uh, you have answered the questions to many questions that we have in our seminar. But I will ask about the permission, the permit from the Commission. Just to be clear, um, if you address the Commission with uh, asking, is it the bank of sanctioned uh, person or it can also be by the creditor? Can the creditor also address the Commission? In this case, uh, I think that it can be also the creditor because the situation can be the other way around. It, it, it means that the money belongs to the company in Latvia because sanctioned person has a relation. And in such case, we also see that such permit needs to be issued because in our interest, it is for the sanctioned person to fulfill their obligations and commitments, not to relieve them from these commitments and um, uh, and, and they are left with, uh, with assets on their side. These cases are exceptions when the permission will be granted. And also one more question, knowing that we have had previously such questions from credit institutions, in the context of other sanction imposition, um, this question has been discussed very, uh, very much. You know, it's been topical. But what about the beneficiaries after sanction imposition? For example, previously the beneficiary and the owners were different, and now they're changing the structure. Yes, uh, such situations we are evaluating, we are admitting as um, circumvention of the sanctions because it is not allowed to change the status of beneficiaries according to the sanctions. So we are freezing any any possible also uh, assets of these uh, of these persons. Also, their ownership rights on the companies uh, and and their rights to transfer their um, uh, ownership rights of the company. Uh, thus, uh, we see that um, such uh, transactions are not allowed because then we have like really big backdoor how you can um, circumvent the sanctions um, where we will not see any more uh, sanctioned persons in the structures of the company because formally it is not a problem to Mm, to register other persons as beneficiaries and uh, to see that in the background actually the real owners and uh, those who control the company are uh, persons from the sanction list. I want to also remind that the recording of this seminar is going to be uh, will be available to you in the home pages of uh, uh, of the organizations involved and let us continue. It is no secret that large part of the sanctions uh, are uh, imposed on the possibilities of uh, transactions uh, between the companies, between the natural persons. So the next speaker, Igor Petrov, Blue Orange Bank, uh, Management Board member and uh, International uh, Financial Section Work Group uh, Manager. Yeah, I hope you can hear me too. So can I have my presentation on screen? Um, so we had a very good presentation so far and also a summary about sanctions and technical uh, details. And we received really very valuable advice how to assess uh, the partners. And I will try to speak about practical aspects. Uh, we will speak about uh, transactions and settlements with uh, 
Russian companies. So about the topics I'm going to cover. At first, I will speak about uh, uh, jurisdictions of sanctions we need to think about. Uh, we also had uh, questions related to that. And uh, I must say that we as uh, citizens and companies registered in the EU, for us, uh, the EU tax sanctions, uh, imposed sanctions are binding. And also for banks that work in Latvia, also FAC uh, sanctions uh, EUS are binding. And so my recommendation is uh, for entrepreneurs also to take this into account, so irrespectively where the accounts are located. And also, I would like uh, to you to draw attention to the sanctions uh, from the UK, uh, which um, is um, not uh, directly binding, but they are very, uh, very often ahead of other jurisdictions and they impose uh, sanctions which are later imposed also by the US and the EU. And we can also not forget about counter sanctions, uh, response from the Russian Federation, which uh, often means uh, that uh, several operations uh, cannot be executed, not due to the EU or US sanctions, but Russian sanctions. For example, to transfer accounts from the accounts in Russia to accounts in the EU, it will not be allowed by the Russian bank. I will speak also about uh, restrictions of export import and uh, sanctioned persons and uh, the uh, controlled companies, banks, uh, which are uh, sanctioned uh, technical difficulties with transactions and uh, relationship with banks. And a little bit, I will speak also about investments. About um, restrictions and limitations for export and imports, I will say honestly, two days ago, I had a totally different presentation in my head, but considering the most recent sanctions, which were published uh, in the EU side, uh, it is um, even uh, quite difficult to tell about all the restrictions because uh, they are expanded and they get wider and wider. And uh, before the war in Ukraine ends, uh, this is just one direction that the scope is expanded. So, and maybe also colleagues uh, who already spoke about uh, export uh, restrictions. So uh, uh, there is import-export relation uh, restrictions related to technologies, uh, military or dual use goods. And also the last uh, developments uh, is luxury goods, which is a very wide scope of uh, goods. That is uh, basis. Um, so how you can determine whether this is luxury goods or not, uh, the, the threshold is 300 euros. So this is uh, um, a, a very wide scope, tennis balls and so on and so forth. And for technologies, uh, this is uh, 750 is a threshold. So a lot of goods uh, are banned. And so therefore I would recommend to check the SRS um, State Revenue Service um, um, web page whether this uh, type of goods uh, are banned and if yes uh, in in line which uh, legislative act and what specifically is banned also uh, i would like to speak about sectoral sanctions uh, which uh, do not forbid uh, cooperation with a specific partner but forbids uh, to finance uh, them so it means that uh, also advance payments uh, can be also considered as financing. And uh, that was important already since 2014. And considering how wide are the restrictions uh, now, it uh, is uh, not uh, uh, binding for a very wide circle of uh, goods. What is also important, what Kristaps already spoke in his presentation about sanctioned persons and also companies they control and properties they control. I will not tell the, the, the same, but it is very important to understand uh, 
what kind of person is our partner, whether they are sanctioned or the, maybe the company is sanctioned at the other end. And also if we speak about intermediaries, so check those intermediaries and also end receivers. And uh, because all this chain of delivery uh, counts and is important. And so I will not uh, spend too much time here, but um, Talking about banks um, under sanctions, so sanctioned banks, there are uh, three banks um, which have blocking sanctions. So Bank Russia, Promios Bank and Web RF. So what does it mean? Uh, not uh, only transactions and deals and corporations with this bank, are not forbidden, but also to the, any cooperation with clients of those banks. And so that limits um, possibilities to receive services. And Alpha Bank, uh, also, I would like to mention it is not directly sanctioned, but this is under the control of sanctioned person. So also payments with clients of Alpha Bank are banned now. So it means you cannot... Uh, uh, send money to the accounts of those clients because bank uh, will deny this transaction and you will not also be able to receive those uh, finances. And also you can uh, see the list uh, uh, with banks in Russia and Belarus uh, um, where SWIFT is uh, not is, is disconnected and so also it's not possible to cooperate with them and their clients and there, there is there are also OFAC sanctions which uh, are partially uh, covering the same and not uh, maybe my topic but i just wanted to speak about uh, technical difficulties with transactions and settlements so generally we can speak about three types uh, first is uh, scpa payments uh, target two and the corresponding accounts scpa uh, payments uh, are um, euros in the EU and, uh, uh, and the Eurozone. And um, if a company is registered uh, in uh, Russia and Belarus and account is in uh, euros and uh, also registered in bank uh, in the EU, then it's possible to have settlements, possibly. I cannot say definitely. And um, also, about um, targets uh, um, to uh, quite a significant part of payments go through target two and corresponding accounts. This is traditional historic system, uh, how uh, this is organized for banks and bank clients. So it means one bank uh, opens uh, uh, the account and in another bank and, uh, and Uh, settlements uh, uh, with other banks and other clients are through those accounts. And so uh, what happens now, if we speak about Russian side, there are uh, restrictions about uh, sending money out of Russia. And uh, this is one. And second is that Latvian banks and also Russian banks and banks of other countries, for example, Austria, Sweden, are very careful uh, looking at uh, corresponding relationship with Russia. And uh, my personal opinion is uh, that we can expect uh, certain difficulties and also restrictions uh, to uh, have settlements with Russian companies which are not sanctioned. This is, of course, a different story if they are sanctioned. Uh, but uh, it is quite hard to, to have these settlements in other currencies except for euros. Uh, but of course, um, it is uh, different for each bank or each of banks because each bank has uh, other network of corresponding um, banks and so if you don't have euros uh, uh, you need to have settlements in other currencies you have to ask your bank whether they technically can provide and uh, ensure of these transactions as to relationship with banks um, uh, I, as we spoke, it is the first step is uh, you have to discover and find out who is recipient and controlling persons and the shareholders of uh, 
the uh, deal you are having and so that they are not sanctioned, the ones you are not allowed to cooperate. If there are intermediaries, uh, shareholders, and uh, if you are doing something through the intermediaries, you have to understand who is the recipient of goods and also who is the sender of goods. As to uh, the steel and uh, the country of origin, for example, company in uh, Estonia and company in uh, Hungary, uh, but the origin of the goods and uh, the steel is Russian, then this is also a violation. So you have to explore all the chain. And what are banks expecting from the client? So maximum details, as much as possible information. Also, the codes of goods. Uh, uh, then we look at those codes and we will check whether this uh, is allowed or banned. According to the li uh, latest de developments in sanctions, I would say that uh, the price for one unit of uh, goods to export it uh, to uh, Russia is um, um, very important to understand whether this can be classified as uh, luxury goods or no. And before you make uh, the transactions, uh, you also submit the documents to the bank so that we from our side can also assess where there are, uh, whether there are risks of uh, violating sanctions or not. And if you have received uh, the permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other competent institution to allow you to do the export, then also it is very important to send those documents to the bank as well. Uh, for the transport companies, it is very important uh, to know that um, that the load was, uh, and there should be these uh, codes of uh, specific goods, and also there has to be uh, information about uh, the sender and shareholders and all the owners and so on. And then uh, also the um, Bank details have to be known of the person, uh, of the recipient. Um, if it's, for example, Alpha Bank, then uh, your bank will not send uh, the transaction to that bank. And also you have to discover what are those technical possibilities for your specific bank to perform those transactions. I also wanted to emphasize that uh, this uh, cooperation with Russia is, is very complicated also with Belarus. All of us, we understand that the uh, uh, reasons for the sanctions and uh, we understand that those regions are under very high risk and so my uh, recommendation would be to think in this crisis not only about risks at the first hand but uh, about the opportunities at the first hand but uh, to think about risks and uh, also about risks of uh, circumventing sanctions. For example, if a partner in Russia offers you to receive payments from the company of the third country, think about it and uh, explore whether this is not a circumvention of sanctions and or attempt to do this. And also talking a little bit about a different topic about investments. Uh, we understand that uh, some of you are investing, some are investing in Russian market and just want uh, to um, cover this question uh, a little bit. So what is important? Uh, the uh, shares of the banks that are under sanctions, are, it's not possible to sell or to buy. No, this is so essential and also um, it's uh, complicated and uh, more difficult uh, to um, uh, to uh, sell and work with securities and also the uh, stock market of Russia right now is closed. And also if we talk about the US and third country emittents uh, uh, which have Russian capital, the trade uh, is still happening, but the risks are very high. And uh, if sanctions, uh, scope of sanctions, sanctions is expanded, uh, it's not, it won't be possible to purchase those uh, shares. Um, also, the, um, uh, um, 
companies and stock exchange of the UK and other large countries have stopped uh, trading uh, shares of uh, several Russian companies and also from the Russian side, uh, it is not allowed uh, to uh, sell uh, the Russian uh, securities um, to non-residents. Um, and so therefore, uh, Russian market is also very toxic and I wouldn't recommend uh, to try to earn money from the uh, Russian uh, exchanges or to play with uh, the shares or obligations or securities. So thank you very much. That's all uh, from my side and I will be happy to answer questions if there are any. Lima, still in Edzardo. Lima, we cannot hear you. Thank you for waiting. We had some technical improvements. Um, besides um, those uh, complicated issues related to sanctions, there are a lot of questions. And as banks are facing them, I will uh, ask them and I hope you will be able to answer. So very practical questions. If the company is... Uh, uh, joint stock company, 50% belong to the Russia. One uh, official is in the list of sanctioned persons. Uh, so how would bank look at this company and what should entrepreneur do and how to assess the risks, uh, uh, stop cooperation or what to do? I would like to say that in general, those are the cases uh, each bank will analyze uh, separately. The structure of shareholders is important uh, to understand whether there are uh, ownership rights. 51% uh, is the threshold if the owner is a sanctioned person or is uh, the company of uh, Russia according to latest developments. And if uh, the sanctioned person is an official, uh, then uh, at the moment, uh, I would say that uh, we would uh, be very careful whether not uh, to qualify this uh, company as a company uh, under control of, of a sanctioned person. So my answer would be I wouldn't cooperate with such a client. Uh, thank you very much, Igor. And you also spoke about uh, several companies that uh, impose um, sanctions. Can you explain about sanctions of the UK? Are they binding for Latvia? This is in context with uh, the um, NATO companies. So we know that the US OFAC sanctions are binding for us, but what about the Great Britain? If we talk about the US, uh, everything is clear. The UK, I would say that this is a very significant partner for Latvia, and therefore I would look very careful, uh, carefully at their sanctions. Better, maybe legally they are not so clearly and directly binding, but practically I would say that we also look at and check the sanctions of the UK. And also a very important question in context uh, about uh, the amount of deposits uh, for uh, the citizens of Russia and Belarus. So what is uh, communication of banks about uh, not exceeding uh, these amounts of deposits of them, how to act and where to search for more information about us? In general, this is a new type of sanctions, I would say, and new restrictions. Uh, which um, uh, we didn't have before. So what happens now is that the banking sector, together with the regulator, we have agreed uh, that uh, the money 
before 27th of February is uh, legal. It was received before restrictions, but if the new money comes, uh, we are checking uh, whether the remaining uh, uh, money wouldn't exceed uh, 100,000. So this is the main information. So for all the incoming payments, we look what kind of uh, the balance is uh, left. And what is also important and essential that whether the citizen of Russia and Belarus have the residence permit, if they have the residence permit in our countries, then this, this threshold is not binding for them. And also the transactions of uh, as securities of a person who have only citizenship of uh, Russia and Belarus, uh, they are under special attention uh, not to exceed this threshold of 100,000. Thank you. Considering this uh, question, it's, um, there are a great interest about uh, possibilities of natural persons of Russia and Belarus to purchase uh, real estate. So from the bank point of view, what is done and uh, what restrictions have to be done. Uh, the restriction is the same as before, 100,000. And uh, if we talk about uh, the lower amount of money, I don't see any problems if the person is not sanctioned themselves. If we talk about larger amount of money, then uh, we are looking at uh, restrictions. The person uh, can, uh, this balance in one bank cannot be uh, higher than 100,000. Uh, thank you very much. Also, the question related um, to the transactions done before. So if uh, the raw materials were delivered already before uh, the sanctions imposed and um, now uh, the money has to be paid. So what does bank expect from the client? The bank expects uh, the client uh, to submit to the bank all just just justifying documents, also documents about delivery of goods and uh, then we will look at the date, at the moment of delivery, sanctions, and make a decision in a very each specific case separately whether to impose sanctions on this transaction or not. If we consider that there is a risk of violating sanctions, we have a regulator, supervisor who can grant or not grant permission to do this transaction. And of course, if bank sees that this payment can be related to the violation of sanctions, the bank would deny this deal. Thank you very much. And the final question. Uh, there is a large uh, interest. Uh, a bank uh, has uh, a lot of uh, questions about due diligence and whether there's uh, san sanctions imposed. So what is experience with uh, um, discovering the, uh, which are the real beneficial owners on the Russian and Belarusian side? Um, our experience uh, to determine the real beneficial owners uh, uh, is very good uh, for Latvian banks. There are registers about uh, uh, Russia, the free of charge, and also for a fee, where it is possible to discover the real beneficial owners. And um, if a specific company is not in the registers, we ask the partners uh, to submit their legal documents which justify the ownership rights. And if it's not possible, then uh, uh, banks uh, take the conservative position. If it's not possible to discover, we most possibly deny the payment. Um, thank you very much, uh, Igor. So, so with this advice to entrepreneurs, we will also continue our seminar. So let us be cautious, let us assess all the risks and whether taking those risks is uh, adequate and uh, whether behind uh, impossibility to discover and then to establish something uh, isn't uh, uh, the 
attempts to circumvent sanction. And now we continue our presentation with uh, FIU uh, presentation and uh, the deputy head of uh, the strategic analysis of FIU, Paus Indienkovs, will speak about the role of uh, FIU in the sanction uh, issues. Uh, hello, Lima. Hello, viewers. Thank you for invitation. And today I'm going to talk about the FIU role. And I do represent FIU Financial Intelligence Unit, and I am deputy head uh, of the department. And I will be talking about the sanction um, searchers. Uh, and this has become very popular homepage lately. I will also be talking about the freezing of the assets, what freezing really means uh, in the regulation and how does it differ also from when uh, FIU freezes probably uh, assets involved in money laundering. Uh, even though the consequences initially are the same, but then they differ in the context what uh, happens or what can be done next with these assets. And the third topic is uh, circumvention of sanctions uh, in the fulfillment of financial restrictions. So FIU, sanction search, sanction search information about the subjects. And this is being uh, uh, published in fid.gov.lv. You have seen probably this uh, homepage. There's a uh, so sanction screening or sanction search. It is something that is crucially important in order to implement the sanctions and impose them. However, we also need to remember that these persons themselves also know that they're in sanction list and they will try to find ways how to hide behind some shell companies, offshore companies, different structures, family members, nominated directors and other companies so that uh, they can avoid the sanctions. So the screening is only part. So it is one, uh, the first step in order to ensure the uh, sanction operation uh, we are we are able to review our partners our business partners whether they are not in the, under the ownership of uh, sanctioned persons and companies also about fiu sanction search is sanction uh, where there we can find uh, sanctioned persons where they're where they have direct directly been sanctioned physical and legal entities or other subjects can be which can be identified and they can be found in UN or EU documents. And this is why we cannot reflect sectoral sanctions on products and services, for example, in our sanction search, because in EU and UN documents, for example, we do not see physical and legal entities uh, who operate in the uh, in the sectoral sanction fields so also related companies and their family members then cannot be included in this list because ownership rights can be uh, changed and um, in the source documents which come from un or eu um, they are not included in such lists so fiu reflects information as it comes from the uh, issuing organization of the sanctions. Also, I need to note that uh, US, UK um, uh, sanctions, direct and single-sided sanctions are not reflected there because we don't have such mandate in order to uh, ensure publication uh, in our systems. And this is why an FIU sanction search will not find Latvian persons who are included in US sanctions. Let us go to uh, the next slide. The sanction search is where we find the subjects as they are also formalization and uh, transliteration uh, in uh, with Latin um, 
in Latin alphabet. So if you find, if you try to find it in Latvian, for example, Vladimir's Putin's, the search criteria is not found. But if we are uh, looking for Vladimir without uh, that word ending S, then we will find. Another little nuance that if the sanctioned decision is made, for example, uh, yesterday or just now, uh, we need to also say that um, the EU, in case of EU sanctions, sometimes there's a lagging behind uh, in order for them to be included first in the XML format, which is necessary for them to be included in the search. Uh, it is updated uh, every hour, integrating all the data coming from the EU, but if EU has yet not included in the XML format, we will not see it. So uh, we, uh, with packages of sanctions, uh, there has been uh, this lag and with the several hour uh, lag, they were published. So we also uh, recommend reviewing the official journals. Well, this is just a nuance. Uh, it can be also so that the uh, sanction list is updated uh, very quickly, the XML format. This is regarding the FIU sanction search. I have to note OFAC sanctions and UK sanctions we have available in our search. But of course, um, you will not find OFAC and UK sanctioned persons in our search. Uh, we have access to those sanction lists, but we are, they are not included in our search. You will not find them there. As I said, we don't have mandate. We have a money, uh, anti-money laundering law um, uh, on, um, on money laundering and uh, terrorism financing. And uh, this is restriction to transfer, use, access, or any activity with assets where the uh, amount, location, owner, user, characteristics and uh, aims of use can change of the assets uh, also uh, asset management so this is the extract from the law uh, on money laundering uh, and we're talking about the sanctions then we need to understand that physical and legal entities against whom the sanctions are imposed all those people all their ownership rights all their assets need to be frozen all their property it comes from eu regulations and also part one section five of sanction law which means that if there are financial restrictions then all persons in accordance with their competence they have an obligation immediately and without prior notice to perform such activities which is to freeze all financial assets and financial instruments and these activities are performed by the credit institutions financial institutions at their own discretion without prior uh, warning based on the regulations of the eu they uh, freeze all the assets belonging to particular persons the credit institutions, banks, they do not report to uh, FIU because this is finalization of the process. This is a direct activity. They report their supervisory institution, which is the FCMC. And then the consequences are clear. This is um, not temporary. This is for indefinite time until these uh, entities or persons are excluded from those lists. Other, it doesn't work in any other way, just like that directly until they are excluded from the list or indefinitely. Oftentimes uh, the freezing is being mistaken with what FIU even does. And as we know, the FIU has the right to uh, issue freezing uh, orders. But it is then when the FIU believes that it might be that the assets are uh, laundered uh, or uh, there's an attempt to finance terrorism or it is involved in terrorism fin uh, fi funding. And always there will be material sent to investigation bodies. Uh, there will be criminal case initiated 
uh, most probably and most probably they are going to be frozen and given back to the rightful owner or uh, seized and confiscated um, in the benefit uh, of the country in case of sanctions with freezing it all uh, ends uh, whereas if uh, in cases when we believe that they might be laundered this money is illicit proceeds then it is different uh, according to terms and according to uh, further activities this is one of the nuances we need to take into consideration until uh, before we get to the last point which is the role of fiu in sanction uh, uh, issues it is the restrictions on uh, financial transactions so the sanctioned persons know that they are sanctioned uh, sanctioned and they will attempt to uh, circumvent the sanctions will continue try to continue cooperating with sectors sectors that are also under sanctions or they would like to receive some economic benefits uh, financial benefits according to sanction law uh, article 13 part 4 index 1 it means that uh, circumvention attempt or circumvention in the law uh, that it, the, the financial in intelligence unit is the competent institution in such cases in international national sanction circumvention and here there is a question uh circum circumvention and breach of sanctions well legally there is no difference nobody defines what is circumvention or sanction breach although we all understand what we're talking about it is the economic resource transferred to sanctioned people persons or entities in case anyone attempts to breach the sanctions in some sophisticated way by using some uh, prolonged supply chains offshore companies hidden beneficiaries and owner beneficiary owners uh, fictitious agreements that you need to report to financial intelligence unit and they are assessing uh, whether money laundering and circumvention um, takes place and they will admit them to be uh, laundered assets and then within the competence of FIU they can later seize uh, confiscate the assets also criminal liability is provided for by that because this is a violation and uh, if as a result the assets uh, gained uh, they are then later hidden then 195 article of the criminal law which is um, money laundering of illicit proceeds uh, so we need to make sure whether knowingly or unknowingly they were or were not involved in uh, money laundering activities at the end i wanted to show two case analysis how uh, circumvention might look like in FIU, we have had such activities when we have uh, found them and we have issued orders on freezing of the assets and we have sent the information to investigation and bodies to law enforcement. Uh, in Latvia, CIA or A Limited registered in Latvia and then Company B registered in Belarus. Latvian company delivers the goods to the Company B. Uh, product delivery is a transfer of economic resource company b uh, beneficial owner is e uh, against uh, the owner of this company the sanctions are imposed after imposition of sanctions the company b signs agreement with the third country company c regarding their credit liability transfer this company is not uh, sanctioned and then the company c performs the payment to company a on the delivery of goods to the company which is under sanctions company b which occurs after the sanction imposition thus it means that company a has transferred economic uh, uh, benefit or funding to uh, company b and thus improved their economic uh, situation and the uh, 
and we made the decision to freeze assets uh, of company A received by company C because this is artificially prolonging of the of the of the cooperation chains and they breached the sanction restrictions so the funding on the account the assets on the account of a received by the company c it was frozen and then transferred the information information was transferred to the investigators to the prosecution and they uh, sent the case to the court and uh, initiated the criminal proceedings and uh, now they're reviewing the uh, question about confiscation and holding criminally liable the involved case number two Latvia in Latvia registered CIA received the money from company B in Russia for all uh, for already delivered goods the agreement is concluded between A and C the company C in Russia and then in the amount of 80 percent this company uh, belongs to another company company D from Russia who is a sanctioned subject if you own 80 percent of company c then it means that this is also a sanctioned company and these uh, relationships business relationships then are well considered to be high risk then company c concludes agreement with company b whereby c commitment is undertaken by company b and they can pay for it so the agreement was signed after d was included in the sanction list so indications about the transfer of the commitment is uh, again the suspicion uh, is uh, there are grounds to believe so that it has been done in order to circumvent the sanctions and thus uh, it is the subsidiary company company c uh, and company b is used as an intermediary for the company c to be able to uh, pay for their transactions again this is unnecessary entity which is being involved company b and company c works as a subsidiary of company d and this is the criminal laws uh, article 84 and uh, also regulations of eu company a received uh, payment from uh, company b uh, which is a result of circumvention of the sanctions and we can decide on freezing the assets of uh, CIA in Latvia and within the criminal proceedings, we can arrest, prosecute and, uh, and convict uh, and, and freeze uh, the, uh, the assets. This means that we see the example of circumvention of sanctions and we need to be very careful and uh, check our partners so that they fictitiously do not fictitiously do not change uh, company structures or uh, cooperation with companies uh, to in order to avoid the uh, sanctions and if there is suspicion on circumvention and breach then such relationship shall no longer be ongoing it has to be terminated otherwise there is a liability provided for by the criminal law uh thank you for your attention my time is up thank you for presentation from fiu thank you paulis and um, we have questions I will start with one uh, rather easy, and I know you can answer. For example, if the company doesn't know, but they have breached, they have circumvented the sanctions, or they have uh, cooperated with, uh, with the sanctioned company, what are the consequences? Well, again, uh, from the point of view of criminal law, whether there are any sanctions, we need to be talking with the representatives of the prosecutor's office but in such case anyways according to the sanction law you have to report the state security service about the situation you have found or found yourself to be so again this intention or unintentionality we need to see whether or not the breach has occurred well it seems like everything has to be okay but 
anyways need to be you, you need to report so the recommendation then is to uh, to research this topic and not just uh, uh, not just go with the flow and think that well you're probably not going to uh, get in trouble yes this is what also companies mentioned and, and today this is from fiu we need to say once more remind this is an unprecedented situation Latvia is especially exposed because two of four our neighboring countries are under sanctions so well, statistically, how many people do, how many entities do have partners in these companies? And this is very important to um, defend ourselves, to uh, make ourselves more secure. Sanctions is just one first step. And this research uh, is the first step in order to make sure that we are not involved in uh, sanction breach. FIU sanction search is first stop, uh, first uh, step but i will ask you this uh, uncomfortable question both from physical persons and entities com companies is it just is there one search engine available where you can find all the information or your uh, as you also said that uh, you have to uh, use several resources uh, although i think i know that what is the answer if you work in a bank if you work in a company with big exposure, definitely you are already aware of where to find the information. And of course, makes sense to develop some paid service even to uh, accumulate all the information. But definitely, yes, currently there is no such engine and, and tool. Uh, the business model might change. Diversification, they're trying to circumvent the sanctions. Uh, for example, they work in the field of uh, sanctioned field, but the, then again, so it's not correct to also generalize too much if they also work in the field which is not sanctioned, but the person, well, maybe not violating anything. So sanction search is step one further is the research of the client due diligence and uh, understanding of those fields. So sanction search in most cases even, will not be the big answer to everything. Thank you. And uh, in the analysis of these practical cases, for example, what it would have changed if, for example, FCMC gives the permit um, and uh, about the particular cases, I will not comment if uh, there the permit were given, because uh, I'm not allowed to also disclose any details regarding these um, uh, regarding these practical cases. Well, I have also changed them, altered them for them not to look so similar to how they really were. This is confidential information, but if you believe that exception can be applicable to your situation that you have to go to the competent institution that I ask for but not create the artificial chain of transactions and to think that nobody is going to notice definitely go and ask for permit in the competent institution because in one case you will receive you will receive the answer no but Thank you, Paulis, for your presentation, and I wish you all good luck in your work and also um, the part of work you do regarding the sanctions. Now let us uh, take a break, a little break, and we will continue with a very broad program. We'll meet Ministry of Finance representatives and other colleagues and uh, State Revenue Service and tax and customs nuances and the two hour conversation also experts from Citadel Bank are going to uh, uh, they're going to join us and we are going to be talking about uh, some conditions KPMG will provide us with supply chain analysis and the Lursoft consultant about management solutions at the end of the seminar we will listen to uh, ministry of justice on physical person asset freezing and related pro processes in, in in the country let us meet in 15 minutes
Sveicu atpakaļ seminārā uzņēmējiem. Welcome back to the seminar for entrepreneurs about international sanctions against Russia and Belarus. And it is uh, important for entrepreneurs to understand what has to be taken into account uh, doing transactions with Russia and Belarus and uh, all the lists of sanctioned persons and so on. Thank you very much for your attention in the first part of the workshop, receiving a lot of questions. We see there is a lot of uh, viewers and uh, they are getting more and more. I would like also to note that the recording of the seminar and also presentations will be available on the web pages of organizers and uh, the questions asked uh, will be answered and we will try to get answers from the institutions and publish together with the materials of the seminar. As the next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, representatives of the Ministry of Finance, uh, the director of uh, the uh, direct uh, taxes department, uh, Aster Kaljane and also the deputy head of the direct tax department, Andres Birums. They will speak about tax aspects and sanctions and answer the questions asked before. Good day. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers of the seminar that they have raised such a topical and important issue and uh, that they are discussing it in a very detailed way with experts and representatives from the sector. Although the previous uh, speakers had presentations, the tax aspect is not very directly related to the international sanctions, but the tax uh, aspect, of course, uh, is derived uh, from the consequences the company might have if their cooperation partners are uh, under those sanctions or they cannot receive some payments from the partners. So therefore, we would like to think what happens to the company if they have a cooperation partner who is sanctioned. And as a result, the company might have problems that it is very hard for them to get back their finances, which were paid for uh, purchasing some goods or uh, some other payments. And if there are some kind of difficulties, we have to look at the corporate tax. And what does the corporate tax say? The companies in this case uh, have to look not only at the existing uh, version of the law, but also right now in our parliament in the second reading is a draft law about changes, amendments in the corporate tax, where there are good things in relation to the debtors' uh, uh, debts. Uh, so how those uh, increase or decrease uh, the income which is subject to the corporate tax. I believe that this law will be approved in the third reading, not later than after three weeks, two weeks. Uh, I, I see that it's not on agenda today, but uh, uh, we saw that uh, the parliament members were very supportive for uh, those uh, amendments. And so what happens? So with uh, those uh, debts, and we have to think not only about our direct cooperation partners, but also that our cooperation partners, a large part of their finances are involved in some other transaction. And so indirectly, uh, this uh, cooperation partner is involved in the chain of these sanctioned companies. And so there is a chain reaction. So what does the corporate tax say? The corporate tax uh, doesn't make us to look at these loans of sanctioned companies to straight away include in uh, the income which is subject to tax. Of course, the policy is uh, that uh, those uh, debts uh, have to be included as uh, uh, costs. And if company consider that they would not get it back, this is a policy of the company. But there is also a separate uh, models that when uh, the savings are made and talking to these sanctioned companies and also supply chains, it would be very suitable to make savings for some time. And so uh, making savings, uh, uh, how does it relate to the this corporate tax? Uh, it relate, relates that 36 months are related uh, to the fact that uh, those savings can be for 36 months, which are not subject to tax. 
and uh, in case if they uh, those uh, debts are not included in uh, the costs and this is a usual uh, regulation which is according to our uh, law also in the draft law which is now in uh, the our parliament the deadline has been expanded from uh, 36 months to 60 months and um, when our cooperation partner has started insolvency procedure so this uh, uh, time frame could uh, even be increased. And also very important uh, for the companies that use uh, the international review standards, standard number nine. Uh, it means um, that uh, the company, the debts of uh, their debitors uh, can classify in a certain way. So not uh, each individually, but they are grouped. And in this case, uh, in the corporate tax, in these amendments I spoke about, there is a possibility for uh, such a model that uh, the company ensures uh, uh, the implementation of standard number nine. And also there is a special uh, accountancy policy uh, re in relation to debts and the company can follow each specific debt. And the module is created that uh, uh, this uh, corporate tax is not increased uh, and this debt do not increase the corporate tax 60 months after it was uh, uh, created. So if we talk about sanctions against uh, Russia and Belarus uh, from the point of view of uh, corporate tax, um, we believe that our entrepreneurs are protected and uh, this uh, existence of this debt cannot straight away create uh, uh, the subject for uh, become subject of the corporate tax. And so this is a traditional transitional period to understand what happens to those sanctioned companies, uh, persons and cooperation partners uh, who are under these international sanctions. I would also like to say that we have to look uh, in parallel the issue, uh, how companies attract uh, finances if uh, their cooperation partners are not able to do settlement. And um, in this case, I would like to say that uh, one crisis uh, we haven't uh, yet uh, finished, and now we have started a new one. And all of us, uh, uh, we been thinking how to make it easier for the companies uh, to attract finances. And we, are, we have also uh, reduced uh, regulations uh, about borrowed uh, money for which the interest is paid. So right now there is a regulation that if uh, borrowed capital and own capital is uh, four against one or exceeds it, then the company has uh, to pay corporate tax for uh, the interest. But uh, this was uh, uh, due to uh, uh, COVID and uh, in the law related to COVID consequences and due to COVID we extended it and, uh, and in the corporate tax uh, uh, article 1, article 10 part 1 is not applied in 2021 but uh, this can be used also in 2022 when entrepreneurs uh, incur so those uh, short -ter term difficulties i hope short term difficulties in relation to the money freezed uh, of uh, by uh, corporate partners freezed money so i would like to invite entrepreneurs to uh, create those uh, savings uh, unless uh, the accountancy policy for the company is not different and the law is quite flexible and also the new amendments will be even more flexible and if we speak about the borrowed uh, means um, there are not uh, exceeded uh, uh, interest payments um, and this was binding for uh, consequences of COVID-19 and also here in uh, this uh, sanction situation. I would also like to emphasize that entrepreneurs have to look at the situation, how to uh, continue their ex activities because uh, uh, there are some 
regulations about annual reports related uh, to the consequences of COVID-19, we can see that uh, this uh, deadline has been expanded uh, in relation to 2021. And many companies in relation to those sanctions, which are directly related to the situation and uh, events in Ukraine, there are problems also with Ukraine and settlements with uh, entrepreneurs from Ukraine and deliveries of various goods. In this um, area, we have nothing new and we are not uh, prepared uh, to speak about some new re regulations, but I would like to remind what the previous speaker said that our Prime Minister, Mr. Karinj, said that uh, they've been thinking what kind of support can be provided, uh, which groups and sectors uh, that will be, we don't we can't speak, but uh, this is a topical issue, and we can see that entrepreneurs uh, can live uh, for three years with savings if they don't make uh, any other decision. I also would like to say that according to the data of the Ministry of Finance, about half of the companies have not used uh, their opportunity to take out dividends, which are saved by uh, end of 2017. So therefore, we consider that partially uh, companies have savings of the financial instruments and so that they can operate with them in uh, the case of uh, severe crisis. And also about the policy of donations in relation to Ukraine, uh, nothing is changed due to sanctions. So the donations policy is if the company wants to use uh, some tax uh, uh, stimulus um, in relation to donations to the civilians in Ukraine or to step uh, stabilize the crisis, they can use uh, the previous uh, uh, system. So there are three models. If the company wants to reduce uh, uh, the amount uh, which is subject to tax uh, uh, because they do donations, and there are two opportunities. They can give donations uh, either from the salary uh, foundation or from the previous year's profit. And the most favorable model, which is uh, applied uh, by uh, uh, half of uh, the donations, then the company can reduce the corporate tax. But in this case, the dividends have to be divided. Uh, and uh, this uh, regulation for this year is that uh, this donations amount uh, ensure that the tax can be reduced uh, by 85%, but not exceeding 30% uh, uh, of tax, which is paid into the budget for dividends. And this is uh, in relation to this year. And also I would like to ask uh, the entrepreneurs to be cautious because the crisis in relation to financial flow and cooperation partners could be uh, bigger than we would uh, expect in the beginning and to be very uh, cautious uh, when you are uh, giving out your finances with any remuneration. And also I, I wanted to say that uh, these donations the entrepreneur cannot on their behalf to bring to Ukraine if they want to receive some tax exemptions, they have to do uh, make these donations to the Latvian public benefit company or to another European uh, um, public organization, or also the, this money can be, donations can be given to the state or municipality, which uh, coordinates the flow of money to Ukraine. And so this uh, was about the uh, support uh, measures, and uh, this was main what I wanted to say. I wish to entrepreneurs to help good balances and to have uh, reserves and savings to be able to uh, live at this time when we have uh, sanctions against Russia and Belarus. And I hope our companies uh, will be stronger next year than this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all this information. From entrepreneurs, we have uh, received one short uh, additional question about taxes. So, If there is um, also this force majeure um, applied and imposed, uh, talking about uh, taxes. So, yeah, here you are. If you are talking about Ukraine, so in 
or, or about sanctions, I cannot answer straight away. Uh, maybe my colleagues from other sectors can uh, uh, speak about it. We cannot answer straight away. Uh, please send in this question and uh, and we will answer to it in written form and you can put it uh, also in your cooperation platform. Thank you very much and uh, uh, good success in your work. Thank you very much. So we have listened uh, to several presentations from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also Financial and Capital Market and also bank representatives and FIU and Ministry of Finance. And we were trying to find answers to the question how these sanctions uh, are imposed, uh, uh, what to take into account, what are the risks of uh, circumvention and uh, what are the possibilities to receive information. And uh, We'll continue with several presentations from the State Revenue Service, also colleagues from the banks, and also representatives from the auditing companies and companies uh, Lursoft. And in the end, we will also listen to the information from the State Secretary of the Ministry of Justice about uh, freezing the property rights. Um, also, I would like to remind that in Slido, we can, you can ask uh, questions. So we are also following your questions on Facebook, but in Slido, it's easier to uh, put all these uh, questions uh, together and uh, also to look uh, for answers uh, later in a written form. And also, I wanted to, to emphasize that all the presentations and also recording of the seminar will be available on uh, the web pages of the organizers. This seminar is organized by the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Confederation of Employers, uh, the Council of Foreign Investors, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Financial and Capital Market Commission, uh, auditor company KPMG, uh, representatives from Lursoft, also representatives from FIU, and the uh, Financial Capital Market Commission are sharing their experience and opinions and information they receive about uh, imposing sanctions on a daily basis. As a um, continuation, next presenters, we have representatives from the Customs Board, the Risk Management Department and Risk Control Department. And they will answer to specific questions uh, related uh, to the customs and sanctions related to the customs and those questions were sent in already before uh, from the representatives of the entrepreneurs and uh, therefore the presentation will be quite short and thank you very much to the representatives from the customs uh, for preparing their presentation in such a short time and uh, Oh, please, viewers, when you ask questions, please try to fit within the topic which is covered in the presentation so that uh, the speakers uh, can answer within their competency. But in case, if the questions are not related to the specific area of their expertise, we will try to contact the uh, responsible institutions and find answers to your questions. We already touched upon uh, questions about list of sanctions, and I, I see that there is a large interest where it is possible in one place uh, to see what are the all sanctions from uh, various angles. And unfortunately, the answer is not uh, uh, so great as uh, everyone would have expected uh, because uh, we need to search uh, for those lists of sanctions in several web pages and later the representative of Lursoft will speak about opportunities uh, provided by the private sector and FIU representative already uh, told what uh, is FIU doing and so what kind of sanctions can be found on their web page but in any case, if we speak about the main steps uh, that has have to be taken in order to uh, impose those sanctions uh, successfully, it is very important uh, to start with an assessment uh, how large uh, largely you are exposed to risk uh, in relation to the sanctioned countries. And then you can make a to-do list uh, seeing uh, what kind of resources and what is needed to do to ensure the imposing of those sanctions. And now, we are welcoming Artis Pilat, uh, who is uh, head of uh, the uh, Customs Department of the State Revenue Service, and also Ilona uh, Stipina, who is uh, the 
head of the control department of the customs board of the state revenue service and um, I will, in short, uh, speak about sectoral sanctions, which are related to the uh, customs uh, area and also control uh, for the import and export and transit. Responding to the question where the information can be found, uh, if people have experience with customs procedures, then integrated tariff uh, management system ITVS. It is the homepage where you can find information, where we receive information from uh, ha where centralized they make decisions. And uh, regarding the customs, they are included in the ITVS system. They're published there. And uh, concerning the products, certain products, uh, you can look in this system. You can enter the country, the product, where you are bringing them, from where they come. And you can look at the regulations which and, and what is included there. And also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and elsewhere, what we have heard today. I, I will not comment more on that. I would like to also say that Customs works not only with products. We are performing some uh, control measures and activities regarding the companies we know uh, they are sanctioned and also the mail uh, and, uh, and luggage is concerned. So the main resource of information is this official journal where there are publications and this ITVS homepage. Additionally, I want to say uh, that the information on sanctions changes very rapidly. We have companies sending us asking questions, uh, what to do, we have a certain product. Uh, and uh, sending to the certain country. I, I want to say that, uh, for example, the, the, the products are being taken from Riga and when they come to the border, uh, while they're being transported, then the sanctions are imposed and they cannot be exported, but uh, it was not, they were not aware of that as at the moment of when they uh, commenced the delivery. And also, as I said, the ITVS system there, you can see the information like export restrictions and import restrictions, uh, and also the new regulation, which is in force uh, as at two days ago regarding uh, metals and steel. So uh, there's a prohibition to import it. Uh, whereas there's also a transition period and regarding this period, there is no one universal answer to all the cases. You have to look at them uh, and review them independently. Uh, individually, each of these agreements, when it was concluded, uh, whether uh, the commitments uh, uh, were fulfilled, and also the product groups, uh, for some of them, there's no transition period when uh, the beginning is as at the publication uh, as at the imposition of the sanctions so sometimes there is no transition period and talking about russia this is what we know already this is uh, oil products uh, mechanisms electronics and what is relatively new is the export of luxury goods, cars, electronic devices with various uh, border values. And um, concerning Belarus, the situation is similar with electronics, mechanisms, military, uh, military products, dual use products and import of timber, rubber, uh, cement, and uh, other products. And th the same is related to the agreements that there is no one general formula. 
you have to review each of the agreements individually. This is all I have. I will give floor to colleague Elon, but actually, no, there was a question from entrepreneurs whether uh, such and such products uh, we can import from Russia and Belarus. We can if there are no other restrictions or sanctions of the import and export procedures remain. We are not closing customs, but of course we need to monitor the risks, uh, what the entrepreneurs have, what is the current uh, law. And now I give floor to Elon. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, today I'm answering two questions. It is the excise. And uh, the first thing is customs bonds, customs guarantees, when the procedures cannot be finalized, and what is the reason why the uh, customs debt occurs, or we will be allowed to finalize the customs uh, procedures. Th th this is basically the question from, from the companies from the business we have received about the customs procedure. If you have already commenced the procedure, you have started the procedure, then it is in force by the fi finalizing of the customs procedure. The, the customs bond is uh, valid. Um, the, the guarantor remains also with his commitment and they, uh, according to the regulation 86 of the cabinet of ministers, then within days it is informed, uh, the state revenue service is informed about the guarantor status uh, that it is ended and uh, when we have received uh, the decision on revocation and as the state revenue service receives the information that they prepared the decision on the withdrawal of annulment of the status of the guarantor if they have informed about their activities what happens with customs debt if in case of uh, annulment we have customs debt then initially the debt is definitely prepared and sent to the uh, to the company and the current guarantor is informed about such decision about debt amount and in case state revenue service is not able to uh, take this debt from the entrepreneur, then they address, uh, they address the guarantor. Usually for the entrepreneur to use, uh, to cover this debt, some other entrepreneur's guarantee or their commitment and liability, then in, in case of sanctions, it is not possible because the sanction idea then um, is not realized, that the aim of the sanction. And, um, and if the debt, uh, customs debt is calculated, it has to be paid. And uh, very similar situation is also with excise duty. It is also uh, imposed uh, this guarantee of excise duty for covering of the excise, and if the uh, products are not uh, then uh, include do not enter the market then but if the products are being moved then it is a deferred excise duty until the products are being taken outside of the european union uh, until the export procedure is finalized um, you should not start this procedure if you are unsure that the procedure will not be able to be finalized uh, EAD, electronic administrative document, um, we do not recommend to uh, 
to start formalizing it because in months you will have to be paying the excise duty. But if you are planning the export and the export of the products is, is rejected, then the products are being taken back to the warehouse and the guarantee is again uh, not not released from so it means that the guarantee will be released but we will have to apply one of the uh, sureties but if we will not be able to apply it then the excise duty debt is uh, occurs um, regarding the using of this if the excise duty is not paid then the guarantor uh, does not uh, submit the documents to the SRS then we then the debt occurs and it is asked to be repaid to the guarantor as as uh, according to the law and one other improvised answer to the question related to whether humanitarian products and um, donations to Ukraine, whether we have to also formalize, then we have all agreed currently in the European Union that it is released from administrative uh, uh, load and document load and uh, Th then we are reviewing that accordingly there is um, permission to declare on the uh, outer border of the European Union as in the delegated regulation. But to formalize the declaration for humanitarian help, uh, cargo, then uh, it is not restricted. But then again, we need to uh, also contact the uh, organizations that organize the support uh, in order to deliver the goods and uh, uh, Poland and Ukraine customs institutions to relieve them from uh, ad additional tasks. But if the declaration is formalized uh, in written form in the system and there are some difficulties uh, with finalizing the export procedure, then um, customs is going to assist uh, in order to confirm all the uh, confirm all the proofs and CRMs, help with formula formalization of them. But again, uh, humanitarian cargo, uh, well, I recommend to organize it uh, in a centralized manner and deliver what is really crucially necessary, vitally necessary. So this is all from my part. And um, I wish you good luck in your work and thank you for uh, such ability to quickly provide answers to these questions. Let us continue with uh, one of the most popular questions in Slido, which we have received about sanctions against Russia, Belarus, and new uh, risks of circumvention of those risks. And this is Citadel Bank representative, uh, International Sanction Department uh, representative, Saiva Krastin. Thank you, Lima, for introduction. And I will tell you about risks of sanctions, uh, avoidance of the sanction from the viewpoint of Citadel Bank. I will also inform you about the context, uh, how the circumvention of sanctions uh, occur, how it's being done, and uh, as the colleagues previously informed, uh, Christoph Markovskis, this, uh, the sanctions are binding to the credit and financial institutions and uh, also to entrepreneurs in the EU uh, established here, registered here, uh, and also established outside in the third countries. So European Union sanctions are binding also to uh, subsidiary companies, uh, Latvia subsidiary companies in Russia and Belarus. Uh, whereas if they are violated, then uh, uh, they, uh, the 
criminal liability is provided for. There are various sanctions targeted financial against particular persons, legal, both natural. Uh, then they are criminally liable, and also the sector sanctions, uh, sectoral sanctions, or, which are directed against uh, Russia and Belarus. They are very broad. Mm, against broad product categories and service categories. And we have seen also since yesterday uh, regarding uh, caviar and uh, golf balls and sports equipment, uh, car parts, vehicle car parts, uh, sorry, luxury car parts. So the restrictions are rather broad and we are facing them and the uh, entrepreneurs are facing them. What happens when the sanctions enter into force if, for example, the credit institution sees that a particular transaction could be related to or is related to violation of uh, sanctions, uh, where there are um, targeted sanctions against uh, particular persons, physical and uh, legal entities, it is uh, incoming uh, transaction, then the duty of the bank uh, is uh, about the incoming payments from sanctioned persons, physical or legal entities, they have to freeze these assets. And uh, outgoing payments, if they see to the sanctioned subject, uh, uh, or, or this company uh, under control of the sanctioned persons, then the banks refuse to proceed uh, with transactions. If we're talking about products and services, then uh, such uh, transactions again, they are refused to be processed. I would also like to highlight and uh, reflecting on what the FIU representative mentioned, that the persons against whom the sanctions are imposed, uh, they, they will, for example, say they will do everything uh, that their cooperation partners notice also that they would comply with any other requirements uh, for the sanctions not to be imposed. But we need to take into consideration that um, it's not just about the physical and legal entities you could find in the list, in the, for example, list of FIU uh, or in official European Union or uh, the United States of America documents, but also against mm, the, the, the companies under the ownership of uh, directly or indirectly uh, under the ownership of those sanctioned persons, but not only the property, but also the supervision is uh, imposed and it is a parameter whether uh, these sanctions are applicable and if the company then is under the control of the sanctioned person, then again the sanctions are uh, applicable, are binding. Uh, so the sanctions against Russia, against uh, Dmitry Kiselev, he is uh, the director of uh, Russia Svodnya, uh, and uh, he owns zero currently shares of Russia uh, but he is uh, uh, he, he controls this um, media and and even though he doesn't have uh, any ownership rights but he uh, controls this media then also all the sanctions are imposed on uh, 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 on this media we have guidelines and you can find them uh, uh, if you if you click on the link below, we would also like to warn the entrepreneurs to be careful because the, the, the sanctioned persons are trying to hide their transactions and ownership rights. And uh, we have already seen in, in presentation of FSAMC and FIU, they're using those prolonged chains of transactions um, and uh, they're, they're not reporting uh, certain transactions. So, uh, maybe the company sometimes is unaware that they are being involved in some uh, sanction avoidance um, 
chains and uh, the, such transactions can be refused to be processed or they will not be, we have to warn them that maybe they will not receive remuneration for these products and uh, because there are sanctions against certain persons and in the case of sector it is uh, against the products or services. And of course they are also criminally liable, well in, in, in the worst case scenario. So law enforcement institution can find, can establish that this company is involved in the schemes of uh, circumvention of the sanctions and if it is organized from Latvia, sometimes it is performed by the Latvian uh, companies so organizing the um, uh, product delivery uh, through Kazakhstan and through other countries, to Russia, to Belarus, if it is performed by the company in Latvia, then, uh, the, uh, then the criminal liability is provided for. Now I will in more detail explain about uh, risks which are the most typical, the most often seen uh, at the bank side how these uh, persons from Latvian side or the Baltic uh, level are involved in uh, these schemes of uh, circumventing uh, sanctions. One of uh, the most uh, classical cases is that, uh, for example, the business with Russian uh, deliveries or uh, also the company ordering uh, something you now is destroyed, but uh, the company in Latvia receives an offer from a new company in Kazakhstan or some other country, and uh, this company is offering to continue the business uh, which used to be with Russia or Belarus. And uh, it's, it looks like that it's a totally new partner from uh, Kazakhstan, and, uh, and the risk is uh, that uh, uh, the Russian and uh, also the Russian companies are following uh, the list of sanctions and what can be delivered and cannot be delivered. And so they are establishing new companies in other countries and using these intermediary companies to circumvent sanctions. Uh, so I will speak about it uh, also later in more detail, but it's very important to make sure who is the real manufacturer, not the dealer or uh, the intermediary, and also who is the end recipient uh, of uh, these goods if we speak about exports from the European Union. One more uh, very typical case is uh, if uh, if, for example, you are an agricultural company and suddenly you receive a very, very profitable um, cooperation uh, proposal in the IT sector. For example, we need uh, to deliver uh, the load of goods and the uh, existing partner has bankruptcy and we need to use your company and please could you help us and the possible profit is 300 or 500 percent and this is a very profitable uh, deal uh, where they offer you to get involved. And this is especially risk if the Russian or Belarusian state structures are involved, uh, where there are dual goods, uh, dual use uh, goods, or also commercially available goods uh, that could help uh, Russian or Belarusian uh, military uh, forces and strengthening their military uh, abilities. And this is, of course, uh, additional annex in the regulation. But um, please draw attention to those uh, once at all uh, offers. And if there is any link with uh, country sanction, be very, very careful. Another very typical situation and case we have noticed is that the cooperation partner is fictitious. If we uh, look at uh, the company register of uh, Russia or Google Maps, you can see that uh, addresses is either fictitious for this company or this company is not registered in the specific address and doesn't exist or something else. And this information which is provided for the Latvian company about their partners in the third country, especially in Russia and Belarus, uh, is not true. 
and there are or there are justified suspicions that it is not true. Also, one of the characteristic situations, if we talk about sectoral sanctions, is that there are goods or services, and in case of goods, for example, uh, the documentation is not precise or it's uh, very general. For example, it is said that IT technologies or um, something else, uh, something is uh, deleted or uh, copied over and it is hard to understand who is the manufacturer or deliverer of these goods and uh, which is the intermediary and uh, the manufacturer, it looks, uh, in reality, the manufacturer is the uh, factory in Belarus uh, that is in the sanction list and this information in these documents is somehow hidden or deleted or erased and uh, the, there is an offer to uh, do the business uh, saying that the, all the documents are not available but everything is good. So if uh, there is uh, something related to the sectoral uh, limitations, the restrictions, um, even if Russia and Belarus is not involved, just uh, make sure that uh, something is not hidden. Also about customs codes. It is very char characteristic that uh, on the surface category in these customs uh, uh, codes, uh, the wrong number is given. And under this uh, uh, number in three levels down, uh, these uh, goods are in the, the sanction list, but this general uh, code of customs is uh, uh, related to something else. So please check all these documents if they are not falsified or forged and that you can make sure about and be sure about the authenticity of these documents. The next example I would also like to draw your attention to is that in uh, if in some uh, documents or contracts, uh, it seems that the partner is the EU company uh, or uh, the US company or company of the uh, country which is not uh, under sanctions uh, but in these uh, documents accounts where you need to transfer the money or registration addresses or postal addresses are uh, Russian or Belarusian. Uh, if the partner is uh, Russia or Belarus, uh, it is clear that this partner of course will have their accounts and addresses in Russian Belarus. But if this partner is registered, for example, in the EU, including also Latvia, but they are requesting to transfer money to another country, especially Russia or Belarus, uh, to the account of uh, the same company in Russia and Belarus, then uh, over there, uh, there could be also risks of uh, circumventing the sanctions. And that could uh, uh, speak about uh, the situation that this company is operating within the interest of the third company or third person, and it means this company is organizing this um, deal with, uh, the, for example, Latvian companies organizing the deal, but they are doing this uh, in the interest of the Russian company uh, who are uh, sanctioned. So please uh, draw attention to those uh, higher risks and risk indicators. Also, the same what uh, FIU representatives said for several times, please draw your attention to those uh, structures of owners uh, who are your corporation partners. So who is uh, their uh, real beneficial owner? And if you see offshores uh, request from your corporation partners information so that they can provide confirmations or documents uh, uh, what is uh, situated and positioned be uh, behind those offshores because also sanctioned subjects can be hiding in these offshore companies where the owners are not known uh, so the in reality the owners are uh, sanctioned and uh, cooperation with uh, Latvia and LTV uh, belonging uh, to offshore company uh, which belongs uh, to the subject of the sanctions that would be also a violation of sanctions. So if you discover such a complicated structure or offshore companies, especially for Latvian companies, uh, cooperation partners, please be very, very careful because uh, most uh, there is there are possible that there are sanction risks. According to the sanction law, all the persons in Latvia, individuals in Latvia, um, are uh, asked to, to be in line and 
and in, in these requirements and we also can request it from our partners we have to say that i have to work according to the sanctions in latvia and the eu so i need uh, all the information to make sure that the sanctions cannot be applied and imposed for this uh, deal another characteristic is that uh, um, unusually large number of intermediaries are used usually you are uh, having uh, uh, business with a manufacturer but suddenly in this uh, business deal uh, the one intermediary appears or even several intermediaries usually we have one dealer or distributor and for example but now you discovered that uh, this partner is not anymore this uh, distributor or intermediary is not operating anymore and there are some, some others uh, who have come up and um, if you see this information about all this delivery chain you can see that there are also sanction risks and my colleague will speak about it later also uh, if we talk about sex sectoral sanctions um, the goods are situated uh, close to the border with russia and belarus uh, uh, close to the uh, transport hubs or uh, ports which are close to uh, russia for example then there are risks that those goods are delivered to this uh, um, village close to the border and at night they are uh, delivered over the border and uh, sanction risks can be seen here as well and i'm not only speaking about uh, border between russia and latvia but also uzbekistan and kazakhstan so please uh, draw attention uh, to which place physically your goods are delivered and uh, if those goods uh, uh, are the ones which are in list of uh, sexual goods then there could also be some violations all these examples i told you about and also at other advice you can find in Citadel del bank uh, web page home page and uh, considering the regimes uh, which are developing every day almost every second day there are some new sanctions we are trying to inform our clients Alliance, and we are publishing on the web page uh, a lot of advice and information and other credit institutions are doing the same. And if we continue uh, how the company is uh, facing the situation that the bank that has discovered violations of sanctions, it is absolutely clear that Latvian banks uh, in no case uh, will execute uh, this transaction or uh, also in specific uh, cases there could be freezing of assets if the sanctions uh, are applied. For example, it is discovered that the partner of Latvian company uh, they are sanctioned directly or indirectly through the control or uh, property rights. In those uh, cases, the transaction is not uh, executed. And right now, banks are requesting a lot of information from their clients about uh, their transactions. For example, if in uh, the payment it is stated uh, um, that it is for goods or for electronics, then um, considering that uh, mobile phone costs more than 750 euros, if it costs more than 750 euros, then um, it's, um, the sanctions are imposed for them if it's delivery to Russia. So banks uh, have uh, a duty to request more documents from clients to discover whether sanctions can be applied for those uh, deals or not. So therefore, um, we are asking asking clients and companies uh, uh, in their payments uh, to put more as more details uh, as much details as possible so that it's clear to understand and also to re reduce the risks both for the company and also for the bank and the third case is that uh, the financial uh, service is not provided if there is no information about the specific deal or if there are a very very high risk that this uh, transaction is uh, uh, under sanctions and uh, there should be a detailed analysis chemical ana analysis in the laboratory to discover whether it's a sanction or not and then uh, consider considering the uh, policy of uh, uh, supervisor of the bank 
regulator of the bank and uh, uh, that their requ requirements might differ from banks, uh, this deal will not be executed. And uh, banks, of course, they are partners together with entrepreneurs and all together we are trying to uh, be in line with those sanctions. But at the same time, we have to remember that entrepreneurs also have to be responsible for their goods and also the uh, parts of their goods that uh, everything is in line in, with sanctions and uh, this is binding for everyone, for banks, for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the state institutions, NGOs reacting to the uh, war uh, from uh, Russia against Ukraine. And uh, if we effectively impose sanctions and do everything possible uh, to have effective sanctions, we uh, then it's possible that the war would end uh, faster and we would be able to return back to the normal business as usual. And the fact that the uh, bank uh, notices this uh, sanction payment and the bank uh, does their side and their job, it doesn't uh, reduce the rest of responsibility of the individual to also make sure that something is not under sanctions. And in case, if you are doubting whether the specific transaction is possible or not possible, and very often this um, possibility is also impacted by corresponding banks and the intermediary banks, so please contact your bank uh, whether this specific deal will be possible or won't be possible. And then uh, this uh, question, this issue will be solved, uh, not uh, getting to the situation that bank has rejected uh, the payment or uh, also the accounts are frozen and it is done when uh, goods are already, for example, delivered. Uh, so that's all from from me. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Simon, I will ask you one clarifying question, quite a challenging question about the new sanctions. I believe uh, that uh, it is possible to um, approach uh, uh, and, and, and answer this about luxury goods. So 300 euros for kilo or for a jar. So if something costs uh, 299 euros, can we send it, deliver it or not? So, so who, who, what do we do? Uh, thank you for the question. All of us, we have questions about these new uh, sanctions uh, which came into force yesterday. As an example, there is uh, this uh, 300 or 750 euros threshold, and uh, it, re uh, it refers to the golf uh, balls. Um, so the question is, how many do we need uh, for this uh, restriction to be imposed? Now, so this is a risk appetite question, actually. And how large is the possibility when you execute this deal that uh, you violate sanctions? So possibly while the sanctions are just recently added and there are no detailed explanations from the European Commission or competent institutions, what can be understood with this? Possibly that in this uh, initial period, uh, there should be more cautious approach until this uh, understanding increases between financial institutions and also entrepreneurs, how to impose the sanctions which came into force yesterday. But uh, the basic principle is, if there are justified uh, suspicions that sanctions uh, can be uh, binding for this transaction, this transaction will not be done. So I return to my advice if you have doubts or uh, concerns uh, that it could be this type of deal. So please, before you do this transaction, contact your bank and discover what is the situation. Thank you very much, Saiva. Uh, uh, have a success in all these challenges. And also thank you very much to the credit institutions uh, for this active operation, uh, looking for answers themselves and also looking for the best solutions for the clients being in line with uh, sanctions. And we will con continue with a very, very topical and uh, uh, current question about uh, supply chains. And we have uh, the representative Edward Grass is from KPMG Baltics, uh, uh, Director and Risk uh, Consultation. So please, uh, 
the floor is yours. Yes, hello to everyone. I am happy to participate and to add to the uh, information given by a lot of experts. And I will speak about uh, the analysis of the supply chains and where to look uh, for information in relation to this. So just a reminder that um, there are a lot of uh, sectors um, which are involved in the EU and the US, uh, so uh, finance, uh, transport, trade, and uh, import, export, uh, natural persons, legal persons. So the question could be how to focus, how to think about it. So in general, if you look, there are several blocks how these sanctions are planned in a, a long term and how the control and risk assessment will be organized. So we will look at uh, what is the uh, business specifics, uh, uh, where do you work, uh, what kind of goods or services you are uh, selling or, or buying, and uh, do you have a, a system, uh, how do you analyze, how do you do due diligence to clients, and uh, mainly today we are speaking about uh, the supply chains of uh, cooperation partners, so you have to check who are the cooperation partners, uh, direct and indirect, how uh, much they are related to Russia and Belarus, what are the structure, what is the information available pub publicly and also in other uh, sources, what are the routes, how these goods are delivered, uh, the sea or and what are the intermediaries and how uh, these uh, goods uh, get to you and and how your uh, goods are sent away. And what we have to consider when we uh, assess our cooperation partner, we look at the registration and the uh, country of operation. Um, so whether they are registered or performing their activity in Russia and Belarus. So this is again, uh, this is the spectrum of the sanctions and, and then we concentrate on these. And also compliance uh, with the sanctions, we have to look at whether the partner is sanctioned themselves. The colleagues previously also said about lists. And, uh, I will also go into detail where I recommend to review the information and uh, whether they are in the owner structure and whether there are some sanctioned persons or companies there. And the third thing is we're thinking about the products and services what kind of products and services are provided by the partner, whether they are sanctioned or not, uh, whether we have to analyze uh, more in detail. And then the fourth stage, maybe the most uh, difficult one, is how to look at the partner is like partners of the partner. So where the supply chain goes further and look at as long as we can into the chain, uh, maybe the this source, the initial source of all the product or service is sanctioned. So again, it is important not to look at the direct partnerships, but also going deeper who stands behind them and uh, so-called supply chain, everyone involved, uh, who performs the payments, are there any intermediaries who deliver uh, the goods, maybe they are sanctioned in, in, in current situation, we all have to be, we have to raise awareness to these topics and be careful and diligent. So it's the principle, know your uh, supplier, you have to gain information on the supplier, this is what, it's nothing new, this is what banks also require uh, from you, from your cooperation partners, you are asking your cooperation partners, this is like, what is the bare minimum and uh, what we recommend is the legal entity name, registration country, uh, ownership structure, who are the direct owners, legal entities, uh, natural persons, uh, then uh, all the structure, beneficiaries, officials, stakeholders, um, as in the presentation of uh, the orange representative, uh, this is how the banks also look at it, this so-called due diligence, and they will not process the payment 
even though sanctions are, for example, not legally imposed. And then uh, the product and services in general, and what does your partner do, uh, whether these uh, fields are not uh, under sanctions, uh, maybe they are not allowed to conduct their services, and uh, we have to understand maybe they're on the way in the supply chain, there are some risks uh, that can uh, raise some problems is, is it a risk for the business or everything happens uh, according to the law and which are the main partners and suppliers and what it helps to understand to the entrepreneur is uh, once again so this is the name of the company uh, as you can uh, compare it against the sanction list you can have a look whether or not that is that uh, particular company uh, because in uh, in various jurisdictions in various countries where it is registered uh, also uh, ownership structures and uh, owners and um, uh, and beneficiary um, beneficiary review against the sanction list the third one compliance with the products and services and their names against the sanction list and the geographic sanction risk evaluation which helps us to understand whether there is any risk that a chain in the whole supply chain uh, is exposed to some risk maybe we need to find more information ask for more information to uh, to research and also information on the main suppliers and cooperation partners of your partners and again also checking it against the sanction list and also the practical information on the resources, uh, reference for information, source of information. The first is you have to think about, and there's a good practice, is know your supplier uh, survey. This is for uh, receiving information from the cooperation partner. If they are not sanctioned and they are interested in uh, continuing the cooperation, then they will be responsive to your questions it is it is the possibility for them to answer your questions we're talking about also the banks uh, because they, they have done it and they they also need it so uh, as they said ownership structures locations of their operations and any information for this due diligence what the partner does who stands behind them etc and this is like the basis which you can independently check in the public databases if you can it is a commercial register list and other state public databases i will also mention in practical examples uh, further other um, credible public sources of information it's media other also if it's paid databases which uh, work with uh, work with some entrepreneurship registers well sometimes it just is enough if you go to google or yandex search and search for some information and then in complicated cases when you really want to continue cooperation but you need to understand uh, and need to be verified by some third party assessors you know what what is going on uh, behind and for them to prepare some information that you have to address also so such services but what you need to do on your own as we were talking about the establishment of these um, beneficiary beneficiaries and who is behind your uh, cooperation partner uh, this is the 50 percent principle that if uh, in some they uh, have this impact or control of 50 percent or more of the company then it means that the company itself is sanctioned and uh, it is important that we shouldn't really risk uh, cooperating with them we have to look at and understand the whole ownership rights structure and uh, again filling in the survey public databases uh, everything we can find out who stands behind them and who 
uh, comprises this ownership right structure. This is one of the examples I will show because at the first at the first level, they do not own 50%, less than 50%, but at the, uh, well, if you go below, for example, person B, uh, person, uh, company A belongs 100% to person B, then in this first level, they do not have the 50% and it's seemingly there's no risk or the person is not, uh, you're not cooperating with a sanctioned person. But again, actually through such scheme, uh, they indirectly own these companies that are sanctioned. And again, uh, resources and information for mm, review of the suppliers, if you want to independently uh, search for information on your cooperation partners. I will now focus my attention to uh, Russia Federation. And this is a um, uh, tax uh, service database. Uh, it's called EGRIP. And um, uh, th there you can uh, input the ID number. It is a free resource and uh, you can find information on the title of the company, owners of the company. This is like the first step. Then you can use also Spark database. It is a paid database, but you can have a demo version, demo version for some uh, time. And uh, then if you pay for it, you will get uh, detailed information and detailed access and also uh, regarding the belarus companies also paid database information Kartoteka. so there are as i said also paid resources so of course not always it is like uh, in latvia for example where these resources are for free but nevertheless i recommend using them and uh, if you look further than how to review the sanctions, then um, one is already uh, FIU mentioned, FIDGOV LV, where there's UN, uh, EU lists, you can search there. Also additional recommendation is to look at the EU sanctions map. It is a EU resource. You can look geographically what are the regions which are exposed to the sanctions, what are in force, particular products, particular services, uh, and also educate yourself on the topic, and find the geographies, compare it to the ones you work with. And of course, you can also gain full list of, um, like it's a full EU uh, list. It is, again, it is the reference of the FIU, but again, you can have a look at, and, but in practice, you have to look at OFAC sanction search sanctions list search and this allows you to uh, search through the u.s sanctions list and the persons there and um, compared to this local search and uh, minimum name score for example this means that they will find some related or not that precisely um, if you search well Basically, that if if there are, if there is a question on how to um, write that person's name, maybe correctly, because you're writing it in Latin, uh, and you can be more free in uh, how you search them, and uh, it is a possibility that you will find them better. You will find their information, who is sanctioned for what they're sanctioned. So I would say that this is a bare minimum of what you have to um, look through. And regarding the regularity of those inspections, then I will say you have to perform them rather um, often because uh, it's just, it's been updated, it's being updated every uh, other day and sanctioned packages after each new sanctioned package you need to review uh, this information so for yourself maybe internally you also store such data or you you have such information on the due diligence and, and, and their uh, board directors and um, you have to keep track of any changes on your particular the cooperation partners uh, you have already. And if we look at the uh, strategic significance uh, product review, then it is uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
is uh, and tariff database with EU that EU has introduced it for import and export dual use products and uh, the database integrated in the uh, state revenue service this was also shown to you previously I will uh, now show you how Tariq database uh, looks like there you can um, write the goods code uh, destination or origin and uh, or review the full list uh, if you wish and there this tn701 for example what does it mean tn702 this is again the restrictions when you click on them then you see what kind of restriction and sanction is imposed on the particular group of products this is a current um, current publication uh, previously this is the new the new parts how it's been amended and what is included further to this particular sanction uh, as said on this uh, and all this can be done also through the database of uh, state revenue service there you write again the goods code or you look at the structure um, map structure it, it's the same and it is in latvian so this may be easier for you now to understand somewhere in the middle there though it says two and this two is those new things like included uh, added and the, the good thing is that this is in latvian at the end i would also like to mention that it is important to think about the delivery route which is being used we have to make sure about any services of intermediaries and intermediaries on the way when the goods are being delivered to you or how you deliver the goods what could be the risks on road and um, because the products maybe are not uh, directly sanctioned but uh, the risk ex exposure occurs uh, due to geographic uh, route so if uh, for maybe there are some uh, cargo controls has to be uh, introduced for example uk blocks all russian linked ships in its ports and there are more plans and thoughts how to restrict the ability of these uh, ships to enter the port so even if your goods are not sanctioned considering the uh, location of the ship then again it can uh, um, restrict their business operations so you have to look at through where the goods are going to be taken and by whom and be aware of any sanctions that are already in force or to be imposed from my part that's it uh, this is a um, summary on how i look at it so where we're going and what direction if any questions you have please do not hesitate. Uh, thank you, Edwards, uh, for your presentation. One tricky question we have from a viewer regarding the Russian resource uh, use, as we understand that the payment possibilities, considering the SWIFT limitations and other uh, Russian pages, are not available for us right now. What to do? What are other uh, possibilities on the research because um, the internet resources are restricted to us for example if we cannot find information what else we can do well so far i have not heard that practically it is a difficulty currently uh, Obtaining information is, is still possible, it's from the practical side, and of course there are other resources as well. It is uh, publicly available information, there are various databases, paid databases, where there are all sanctioned lists, summaries, uh, very various uh, service providers, maybe they're paid, maybe you have to go somewhere, but if you cannot directly, for example, access the available databases in practice, I've not had uh, maybe anything, there's no other possibility but really use what is available to you, what you have access to. 
even if you don't have access to some particular resources, then use the ones you do have access to. Thank you, Edward, and good luck in your work and also related to sanctions. And we are continuing on the aspect of obtaining information, one of the most crucial in the field of sanctions, and now Lursoft Corporate Client Consulting Ruta Beiruta on a sanction review solutions. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will be closing this seminar with practical things where we find information, where we find information on our uh, cooperation partners. My name is Ruta Beirut, and uh, I am working in the Lursoft with the large and uh, medium companies in Latvia. And um, Lursoft is uh, that company which um, is um, searching for solutions uh, in order for us to be able to to, um, to access the information. Sanction topic is not new. In 1997, we already started working uh, in this field. Then uh, we had money laundering law and other amendments uh, taking shape. But again, how it was um, perceived, they said, okay, maybe the accountants need this for their work. But then 2009, we had a person, uh, or later we had a person, somebody from Furzame that was also included in sanction list. And only then we understood that this is something that we can all face and this is very close to us. Now it is 2022 and no question already uh, anymore remains on the significance of this topic. So let us move on into this topic. Sanctions against Russia and Belarus, practical numbers, uh, impact of Russia and Belarus uh, companies on our economy, then capital investment from Belarus. We have a rapid growth, then again fall, but anyways, it's been 19 million is the amount which is invested from this country. Whereas if we look at Russia, then even though there's a stability uh, over the last years, but this is 429 million of uh, investment. As you understand, these numbers are not uh, low, they're not little then. And if we look at the impact of Belarus and Russia on our economy, then in taxes, both these countries pay approximately 170 million. But if we're looking at the employment rates, then the, the companies related to the capital, to these companies, this is uh, almost 18,000 employees. And why not, like um, Russia is... Uh, number seven, uh, on the number seven of investment. Well, look at the sectors, uh, we can see that uh, the largest uh, number of the companies are related uh, to the transportation of uh, loads and the real estate, if we speak about Belarus, and also the whole sales and the sales of timber in case of Belarus. Uh, if we talk about Russia, the most number is investment of real estate and also IT um, loads transporting and also construction and uh, of uh, uh, living houses. So those are the companies uh, that we theoretically need to look at and also control. And so quite a large number. If we look at uh, the actual numbers, uh, capital investment, we can see almost uh, 700 Belarusian and Russian for about 4,000 companies. And if we talk about uh, um, participants, natural persons, uh, more than uh, 4,000 from Russia. And usually uh, we look at the Latvian companies, but actually the largest risk are our cooperation partners. And that we have to remember, especially when we we sell our products and also purchase raw material, materials, not only in those two countries. We have to analyze uh, very attentively all international transactions and also uh, to discover who is a real beneficial owner. This is not uh, just a wish, but this is a real necessity. If you look at the resources uh, to check and control the sanctions in order to do the high quality 
control. We have to understand who is uh, our client, uh, all the persons uh, involved in his uh, chain of supply. And if now we do transactions with foreign countries, we have to uh, discover who is intermediary, who is end recipient and partners of our clients. And uh, we often face uh, challenges like uh, uh, my colleagues already spoke before that there is no united databases, not a lot of databases where we can enter and find information about any country in the world. We also don't have information about local registers of the countries. And if we find it, the local uh, company register of those uh, countries are in uh, their official language, state language, and it is very hard for us to find something. And even more problem, which we feel now, especially with small, medium companies, is um, feeling that uh, data is very expensive in other places. In Latvia data, of course, is just relatively cheap. And if we understand uh, the costs of uh, high quality databases of other countries, this is another uh, reason which deter us and which stop us uh, look for and control this. And uh, instead of that, we are looking for uh, other databases which are free of charge, but the information might be obsolete, not updated, not uh, having uh, really updated data those. And all this together lead us uh, to a very formal attitude and formal analysis of uh, transactions. And we have to understand that we cannot continue like that. And so the first question and first thing I wanted to emphasize is ask your client for information. And not only information about their company and persons and partners involved in their company, but you can also ask your client, how can I verify this information? information in your country? Where is the register or databases in your country where I can make sure about data submitted? And also don't remember, uh, usually, as usual, when you receive this information, review it and check once more whether what uh, the cooperation partner has submitted to you is really uh, valid and uh, uh, updated. And this is a very, very uh, huge necessity now to avoid uh, circulation of uh, false information. And of course, you have to understand that it's sometimes not enough with just one case, one checking, but uh, you might need to request information also during your business deal. And be prepared that the same questions can be asked also to you and the same documents you possibly also will have to submit. So once more, where can you search data about client? In Latvia, for Latvian companies, the data are not problems. So data about Latvian companies, companies can be uh, found on open data portals, uh, the company register, and also official uh, company register data users' databases, for example. And in case if you ask clients and the information you receive from them is not sufficient, sufficient you can also look at uh, the uh, e-justice portal and uh, find the information, also look at the open data in a specific country, and in uh, serious cases you can use, like next, uh, so the previous uh, colleague uh, uh, in the presentation spoke about other databases that can be used uh, in relation to Russia and Belarus. So in any case, use all these opportunities uh, to really check your partner not to uh, approach all these processes just formally. And all the day we are speaking about the fact that it's important uh, not to, uh, only to look at the company and uh, uh, persons involved, but also look at uh, the business part. And here, as much as it is binding for Latvia, I would like to say that there are no problems. In our market, there are several solutions also. Lursoft offers uh, those spider maps so that when you discover and uh, find a specific person very easy with uh, one uh, push of the button, you can also see the relation to other companies. So these uh, linkage uh, graphs are very, very 
usable and uh, valuable instrument to see how Latvian companies are involved between themselves. But if we want to understand what are who are the business partners of our partners, again, with Latvia, it's quite easy. We have created several instruments, for example, personal dossier is one of those. Uh, all these uh, linkages are put in one uh, table and you can read it and make conclusions. And when you have discovered uh, who are the involved persons, then you can check uh, types of sanctions. And uh, let us remember that uh, there are two types of sanctions, but uh, what we are checking, there are uh, financial and uh, uh, civil rights uh, uh, limitations. And if we talk about uh, uh, sanctions, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for Latvia there are a bit more than 18,000 subjects of the sanctions, then in uh, Russia those are about 2,000, and uh, in Belarus it's uh, about 500. And if we talk about search engines, so where can we find uh, and where can we check the companies and the linked persons? One of those solutions is uh, the web page of uh, FIU. My colleagues already spoke about it. And in their search, uh, you can look in the UN, the EU, and the Latvian sanction lists. And at the same place, uh, there are also links uh, where you can make the next step in OFAC and the UK sanction list. If we talk about financial uh, things that you can uh, do it in OFAC page, uh, it's showing uh, this once more, my colleague already told about it, and the third the free of charge uh, uh, search engine is also Lursoft. So Lursoft uh, sanction search engine is uh, supplemented, so you can uh, look uh, for sanctions in all the four uh, places which are binding, plus the United Kingdom, which is also uh, very important for Latvia. And also the transliteration uh, peculiarities are also added. So you can find the sanction subjects even if you write their names uh, in Latvian with uh, Latvian letters, or if you write with Latin letters, which are not in line with uh, translation from Kirillica. So this uh, search is uh, uh, much, much uh, more uh, sensitive not to, to make mistakes due to transliteration. And also in this uh, search engine, there are additional um, linkages about some kind of uh, um, uh, some uh, things which uh, mix uh, fit, uh, which are the same in several documents. And so there are uh, possibilities not to miss some information due to uh, you maybe uh, some write, writing uh, mistakenly or something like that. Uh, and also, AML information lists are also created here for the subjects of AML law. So it's accountants, uh, lawyers, and uh, uh, court pilots. And uh, their duty is not only to check uh, sanctions, but also state risks and address risks and so on. So with push of one button, and you can generate uh, this information where there are much wider information and also the uh, sanction lists are checked uh, checking the company itself and also officials and the sanction chains uh, through which uh, the beneficial ownership is done. If your company has internal control system, if you are checking uh, those sanctions, but you don't need such a wide group of risks as it is uh, in AML uh, risks, then it's possible to do the automated checking of sanctions and you just uh, uh, write down the name and uh, you receive 
uh, that document, then it's very easy to save this document. So those automated solutions in very simple version are available. But the problems uh, occur in cases when there are several clients. And if there are several clients, we have also created a solution. So one of those is uh, data checking with files. So you can export uh, registration numbers uh, from Excel uh, in the checking system, do the checkings and uh, download results. This is fast, this is uh, very convenient and also uh, adjusted for uh, several larger portfolio of clients to be able to check several partners. And in this way, you can uh, both check Latvian companies and foreign uh, companies and persons if you have gathered such data. And for a very large companies, one of the solutions and the main solution is uh, the linkage of the system. So it is possible here to link together the systems so that they among themselves automatically do the sanction checks. And this uh, this can be done uh, before uh, writing the uh, new invoice and also pressing the button refresh and also after the registering a new client in the system. So such kind of linkage between systems is also possible. But changes of sanction uh, and updates in sanction lists uh, happen not uh, only by days but also by hours. So it is very important to be able to follow everything that happens. And there is also automated uh, function which is sanction monitoring. If we have uh, summarized the lists of our clients, we can uh, switch on this monitoring in case if uh, some of our partners or clients get into the list of sanctioned persons, we can receive announcement about it in our email. And there is also a possibility uh, not to receive an email, but uh, to have announcement in our system and so that uh, specific uh, blocks uh, in relation what is found are also uh, highlighted and so you receive this information. But in case if this automated supervision and monitoring is too difficult, you can also uh, look at uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, webpage, uh, the bulletin of uh, sanctions, where it's a very, in a very nice way, it's summarized what changes are uh, and what updates ha have happened. I will also speak about sectoral sanctions because we, can, we are able to check people's and, uh, people and companies, but sectoral sanctions um, they are binding for uh, the goods and sectors. And it is not so easy to find them in these sanctioned uh, lists and search engines. And uh, I would recommend to use the map of the EU. Where you can open a specific country and you can see what are the bans. And also you can look at the UN uh, sanction map and see what kind of sanctions and bans are for a specific country. And so in summary, what and where to check. So right now, the checking for sanctions in relation to Latvian companies and foreign companies and foreign persons, it's not a problem anymore. Uh, for this, uh, free of charge and also without authorization, you can use uh, the FIU search, OFAC, uh, OFAC uh, uh, search, uh, and also LURSO. If we speak about automation, uh, that uh, would help us to save time and so on, so for uh, AML subjects, uh, a special uh, automated solutions are created uh, for small companies and for medium and large companies. We can uh, organize sanction check with Excel and also that can you also do yourself or also uh, we can uh, assess all your portfolio according to the necessity, which is for your specific business. For large company, there is uh, the link of the systems where sanction checks are performed automatically. Therefore, please use all the available and offered solutions to be able to protect your business uh, from uh, financial and reputation risks. That's all from my side. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Rota, for description. Such a wide and such a really good description and uh, uh, solutions how to solve various problems. And let us continue with additional guests, uh, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Justice, uh, Mikhail Popsevich, who will speak about uh, the updated uh, things related to sanctions, which is of uh, high interest for the public and also entrepreneurs. So aspects related uh, to the real estate and uh, freezing of real estate and other issues. Please, the floor is yours. Well, we are waiting for the State Secretary um, to connect. I would like to remind that it is possible to ask questions uh, using uh, hashtag uh, sanctions and also, also the presentation. So materials are available for everyone. So, good day. Can you see me? Yes. Can you see my presentation? Please do full screen, then we can see it. So, can you see it now? Okay, then I will speak without presentation in this case. So what I will provide information today is related to the real estate and uh, the sanctions imposed uh, on real estate. Also, under the supervision of the Ministry of Justice, there are other registers. So we are speaking about the company registers that has 14 various registers, but the information where you can find information about sanctions related to the companies, you heard about it. I was listening a little bit to the previous speaker, and I believe that all this workshop is about this. Uh, so I will not comment about this. I will just in the end uh, say a couple of things, uh, what uh, we do in the company register what uh, we haven't had before. But right now I will tell about the real estate issues, what is done in this area. So one of the objects against which the sanctions are directed is real estate, real property. And we are talking about any kind of real property, both buildings, land, uh, forest and uh, water bodies. So the rights on the real estate has to be registered and there is a land register um, and also they have homepage LV, which is land register LV where you can see this is state official information where any real estate is registered and there are special marks if there are some encumbrances on this and there is also information on the sanctions there is a summary on sanctions regarding the property and if we're talking about the sanctions on uh, real estate and property then uh, you can see that both for legal entities and uh, and physical persons, the information there is only about those people who are sanctioned. And there are certain rules, so those marks and uh, uh, are regarding the particular um, restrictions are decided by the court, by the regional court, and then the court uh, performs this, uh, puts this in the register, this information. And then this information is given to court administration, which is the administration under the Ministry of Justice. And they take all these lists, sanction lists, which sent, and this is all sent 
to the courts. But this is only related to one part, which we directly see in the sanctions list. And this is why the court administration, additionally, together with the commercial register, they identify not only the persons included in the sanction lists, but also legal entities that are related to these people, whether they are beneficiaries, or they are beneficiaries of some supply chain company, or some structure company, and they have impact or control over the real estate related to this real estate, or they gain some benefit from it. Later, when these persons are identified, the court administration sends information to all the courts, and it is the obligation of the court to review these announcements within 10 days and make their decision. So they're making the decision on further restrictions, uh, restrictions to or bans to, to do anything with this property. And uh, as they review, they perform certain activities and then they leave these marks that these activities have been initiated. What I need to tell more here is that, and that is important, is we cannot exclude the situation that when the beneficiary or some related person, that they are trying to avoid these bans. And um, for the court, all those, um, all those requests, confirmation requests, they reviewed them um, uh, in, in the particular order, but the uh, sanctions are a priority uh, if a person has been in the sanctions list. The, they are going to primarily take this uh, request from the court administration and uh, impose ban on certain activities for the property. What this ban really means in some more complicated word, uh, words, this is uh, this is basically a uh, civil liability encumbrance. It means that they cannot uh, give it to someone, transfer the rights to someone. They cannot sell it. They cannot. Uh, preserve it, uh, seize it, and this is after this mark, they cannot do any of these activities, so they cannot attach it. And this is related to also transferring uh, if the person is uh, from the sanctions list dies, then uh, this inheritance transfer cannot be um, well, it cannot occur here in this situation. This cannot be transferred as an inheritance. The next question is, again, what this uh, sanction, what this ban means, we have heard in the media. It is, you cannot transfer the rights of ownership or using rights of this property. So it means that the owner of the property can remain the user of this property. If, they're the, if the people live there, they will be able to continue using the property. But here are the questions which arise. For example, it is some business property and is it is being managed so that there are some um, premises of the property or other premises of the property are, are used by other physical or legal entities. And the question is, in this case, whether it can continue this operation or not, because the agreement uh, continues to be in force. But if we're talking about the sanctioned persons or persons related to sanctions, if their assets are frozen, we need to take into consideration if you transfer them money and you objectively were not aware of that person ha uh, has been imposed sanctions on, these assets are going to be frozen and, and you will not be able to pay them also. So I want to stress that such situation uh, on the transactions can only be allowed if really you do not know or there has not been a possibility 
to find out uh, what kind of uh, or if any sanctions are imposed on the particular person. Uh, commercial register, court administration are working actively uh, to ensure that the legal entities, related legal entities for those uh, properties, for those properties to have sanctions in the future and the information is updated as quickly as possible. So this morning at nine o'clock, the courts have been received, uh, have received 41 announcements and for six of them, they have already had those ban marks, which means that the courts have already decided and made the decisions and uh, ordered uh, changes in the land register. This is a... Uh, and some of them were physical entity, natural persons, but the others were uh, legal entities uh, where the beneficiaries are sanctioned. This is about this uh, unified single land register information. And I also wanted to say that already today, I hope that uh, tonight, but uh, tomorrow the latest, uh, the Ministry of Justice is going to publish information um, on other state register, uh, state registers, uh, which is the resource of a different um, state institution on uh, vehicles, on transportation units, water transportation units, air transportation units, and also that Ministry of Justice is now working together with the uh, commercial register. We are preparing amendments in a law thereof that um, these rules also are imposed on the legal bodies. Uh, where the sanctioned entrepreneurs are actually in the chain or the ownership right, the ownership right belongs to them or their beneficiaries. This is from my part. Uh, everything I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for comments from uh, the Ministry of Justice. And uh, the questions we have uh, is, uh, they are related to the other information that will be yet published and uh, good luck in your work and thank you. Hereby, we are finalizing, concluding today's seminar. Thank you to the speakers, to the listeners, to the audience. And I would like to remind that the recording of the presentation, we are going to have this presentation, this presentation, this seminar, recording of it, published in the web pages of the organizers. Chamber of seminar material. And by condemning the war in Ukraine and to reach the objective, we are finalizing this seminar. The sanctions can only be lifted when the military, the, when the war ends and the international law is obeyed and the uh, rule of law and peace is ensured. Let us all do all that is in our force to, uh, to ensure this. Thank you all for listening.